Sophie, can you hear that um, saw outside my window by any chance? No, I can't. Great. Okay. That's why I'm wearing, <laughs> wearing the headset. Um, we're neighbors doing construction today right outside my window. <laughs> of course, because why wouldn't they? It's okay. It doesn't bother me. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't background noise. Yeah, you are good. Good. Well, Jacqueline, you missed a good reception last night. Hope it was, how was your daughter's uh, softball game? Well, we left because she ended up getting a concussion in the middle of it. So it was no. terrible. <laughs> yeah. It's uh she's a catcher. So she got a foul tip to the helmet. Oh yeah. Yep. So how's she doing I'm, today? I'm, I'm especially glad I have to say, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I missed it, but I'm especially glad I was there because of that. Otherwise Absolutely. she would have been with other people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's um, the doctor said take a couple days off school and um, no homework. <laughs> well, she might like that part. Yeah, and then they'll test her again. They do this cool thing where they test your eye movement and they can tell um, from the computer can read your eye movement. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty advanced back from like when I was a kid and they told you to walk it off. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. rub dirt on it, right? <laughs> Yeah, my youngest daughter um, said she sprained her wrist, and after about a couple of weeks, I said, "Would you go get it looked at?" And she oh my broken, gosh! And she had broken it. Hairline. Oh no! Hairline. But, no. but you yeah. know, it's, so it's so like just walk on it; it'll get better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How old is your daughter, Jacqueline? She's a freshman in high school. And this, unfortunately, was her second concussion. She also plays rugby. And so, oh, my word. She plays rugby, too? Rugby and catcher and softball. And so we're going to have a little talk this summer about, you know, taking art classes or <laughs> finding other activities <laughs> that don't cause brain damage. Basket weaving 101. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> I bet you there's a lot of uh, unclaimed scholarships for that.
So John, we're at 9.02. Do we want to get started or wait a few more minutes for people to join? We have Mr. Garamendi on. I don't think I've seen him. No, he's not on yet. Okay, Sophia, do you want to ping Henry? Yeah, I'll uh, give Henry a call real quick. Okay, and I would say let's go it in uh, one minute. How's that? Or half right. a minute? Half a half minute. minute? Okay. Yep. If uh, he doesn't show up, do you want to switch speakers? If he doesn't show up, we'll move Eric to in front of him. How's that, Eric? That'll work. How do I get oh, the no, message? Oh, I, see, I see Congressman Garamini. Oh, great. Okay, so let's Here go ahead. I am. Hey, John, how you doing? Hello, Jocelyn. I'm doing very well. I think I heard John Coleman's voice, but I don't see your face right now, John. You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Eric is there too. Oh, Hi, familiar John. faces all around. Okay, well, we're, we're going to begin now. Why do you go Laura's ahead? Laura's starting, right, Laura? Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna talk quick and I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Laura Kennedy and I'm president of the Bay Planning Coalition Board of Directors. On behalf of the Board of Directors, I wanna welcome all of you to this year's Spring Summit. And I especially wanna thank our sponsor. Someone just muted me. Um, <laughs> I'm back. Um, so I do wanna thank some of our sponsors of this Spring Summit and they've been showing up on your screen. They're also listed in your program. And I really want to thank our sponsors of the great reception we had last night. That's Cargill, BIA Bay Area, Geosyntec Consulting, and Wilshire Consulting. The past several spring summits have examined ways to expedite the planning and permitting of resilient infrastructure projects. This year, we're going to continue that theme and focus on planning strategies and funding. The challenges and opportunities that you're going to hear about today are part of BPC's mission. I encourage all of you to join our committees to dive into these topics further, and please attend future workshops and briefings to continue these conversations. If you're interested in becoming a BPC member or want to join a committee, please contact John, Sophie, or Cameron. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Jacqueline to lead us through this year's program. Thank you, Laura. I am very excited to be here at what is probably my 18th or possibly 20th Spring Summit, or for you OGs out there, it used to be called the Decision Makers Conference. Uh, I have to say, every year, I truly believe it gets better and better, and I leave feeling so comforted that we have so many creative and dedicated people in our community to help say, solve all of our Bay Area issues. Today is no exception. We have a packed morning full of top shelf speakers and panelists. So I hope everybody is comfortable and ready to dive right in to funding resiliency. But before we get started, I want to give a huge thanks to the Bay Planning Coalition staff, John Coleman, Cameron Carr, Sophie Douglas. They have worked endlessly to bring value to all of our members, and it shows. And I want to further thank you, Spring Summit Committee, Dilip, Laura, Russ, Annie, and Elijah. So we're going to kick things off with a bang right now. Please help me welcome Congressman John Garamendi, representing District 3 in California. John has been a longtime friend of the Bay Planning Coalition and a frequent guest at our functions. We are thrilled to have him back today to discuss shoreline resiliency and its importance to the state's economy. I do invite all of the audience to take a minute and review his biography. It's available. We have a speaker biography packet. And there you can read a little bit about his extraordinary history advocating for his constituents in terms of defense, infrastructure, and consumerism. So again, I'm very pleased to welcome our first speaker of the morning, Congressman John Garamendi. Thank you very much, Jacqueline, and a shout out to your entire team. This program, uh, I, you're correct, I've had many years of opportunity to speak uh, with you. When I was Lieutenant Governor, it was the uh, uh, State Lands Commission, everything to do with everything in the Bay and beyond, up and down the rivers and off the coast, and more recently as a representative uh, in Congress, where I represent 199.6 miles of the Sacramento River. That's my current district. As I look to the future, it's going to change. I basically will, with a successful election, which I'm hoping to have, uh, I will have the uh, honor, the privilege, and indeed the pleasure and challenge of representing uh, all of the water part of 
Contra Costa County. So from uh, El Cerrito, not exactly on the water and uh, Kensington, but Richmond all the way up the river to Pittsburgh, an extraordinary challenge. And then jump across the river over to uh, Benicia uh, and uh, Vallejo. This is an enormous opportunity for all of us, and particularly for me with uh, whatever history I have, to apply that history on an extraordinarily important part of the economy of San Francisco Bay and Northern California. Uh, the ports, the five oil refineries, uh, all of the history that's in the area, the commuting systems, the transportation systems, all of those are in play to say nothing of the water. And if you wanna talk about resiliency, we're gonna be talking about it big time in this area. A couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, I think we need to review history here. Uh, clearly uh, the San Francisco Bay has been in a major uh, industrial uh, area. It's also been a major source of commerce, both uh, within the state and internationally. It must remain that way. Uh, obviously the uh, industries, uh, the economy has changed over the years from heavy industries and agriculture uh, to you, the sir. industries of technology. Talk to you later. Uh, yeah, all of those are in play here as we look to the future. All of it is all of these issues that we must address. Okay, uh, I hope I was un unmuted for all of that. Is that the case? Yes, no? Just for the last few seconds. Okay, very good. Uh, all of these issues that uh, are historic to San Francisco Bay and the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta and the rivers that flow into it are overridden by the reality of climate change. Uh, back in the 90s when I was Deputy Secretary of the Department of Interior in the run up to the uh, Kyoto Conference, uh, five deputies and the other uh, environmental organizations in the Clinton administration were tasked with developing the American agenda for that Kyoto Climate Conference. We did. And what we predicted would happen uh, in the uh, decades ahead is in fact happening. Uh, the fires we know, ocean level rise, we understand that is happening and it will accelerate as the climate warms. Uh, we knew that there would be mega storms and we're seeing those. Uh, we still have and we will have more of what I like to call the Pineapple Express. Uh, the uh, atmospheric scientists want to call it an atmospheric river. Pine Pineapple Express suits me well. But in any case, all of these things are in play and they will have a dramatic effect on the Bay. Uh, the sea level rise will cause serious problems at the Port of Oakland and San Fra at, at the airport in Oakland. Uh, as well as the uh, San Francisco airport and uh, some of the smaller airports around. Also, there will be inundation of areas that are now habitat. And so how do we deal with this? Well, first and foremost, we have to deal with the climate. We have to deal with the reduction of greenhouse gases. And that will have a profound effect on what I hope to be my future district. All five of Northern California oil refineries are in this district and the tens of thousands of jobs that are directly associated with it. Um, my take on this is that we must find a transition path uh, for all of the carbon fuels. And I am very, very pleased to find as I visit the refineries and the communities around them and the leadership in the area, starting with John Joya, my very first uh, meeting when I knew what this district would be, uh, he sat down, we talked about it, and he said, we're building a team to look at transition. And also uh, Tim Grayson, uh, the assemblyman in the area, put together a, uh, a bill that's now in place, uh, creating a green technology, green empowerment zone. Those provide the foundation for strategies on how to maintain the employment, how to transition, uh, the current effort by uh, Phillips 66 and, a, and another refinery to, tra to transition to bio, uh, renewable biofuels all march down this path of transitioning. In addition to that, we have a very serious uh, problem, but one that can be solved. And that is the training of the uh, men and women that will be necessary 
as the current generation, myself included, uh, retire and move on. So this is part of the educational and training programs that we must address as we transition, uh, at least in the Contra Costa East Bay area, from these uh, uh, fuel systems that have propelled the American and indeed the international economy uh, to different fuel systems. The hydrogen economy is already underway. The sequestration of carbon already being discussed. All of these are in the future. We also look at what we can do with the assets that we have in place. Consider for a moment the oldest uh, naval base on the West Coast. That would be Mare Island. It was bracked, moved out of the military in the 90s, and has been an asset that is not fully utilized. Uh, the uh, arrival of the Coast Guard cutters there about uh, eight years ago was having something to do with the fact that I was the ranking member of the Coast Guard Maritime Committee. It's now routine. Also, we're seeing some naval ships arriving there to be repurposed. Uh, we know that there's more to come. The, uh, in working with the uh, dry dock country, a company, uh, they're willing to make a $13 million investment as a result of the reality. Again, my responsibility to make sure that every naval ship is properly maintained, that it has a uh, place where dry docks are available. Uh, it's clear that on the west coast of America, there are insufficient dry docks for the US Navy. Taking advantage of that need, the uh, Mare Island Dry Dock Company is going to invest $13 million and to begin the process of bidding for the repair of naval combat, combat vessels, which they cannot now do uh, because of the insufficient infrastructure and security that they presently have there. If that comes to pass, there'll be some two to three thousand eight eighty to a hundred thousand dollar a year jobs and starting salaries very much in that range. So this brings me back to the issue of uh, workforce preparation. How do we get the workforce prepared? That's the educational issue. Um, final point, and then uh, if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All of this will require that we create a robust dredging program in the San Francisco Bay and up the channels to Stockton and Sacramento. Uh, right now, we have a problem at the Pinole uh, Shoal, and uh, that has to be addressed. Uh, we're looking for a local sponsor of what is known as the Stockton Program. That's not just Stockton. That's everything from Stockton all the way to Richmond. Uh, and that's a, that is a critical dredging program. We're working with the state right now to see if they would become the sponsor of it, or maybe we can cobble together the various ports uh, and uh, interest groups along that entire stretch of the, the Bay and the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. We'll see what comes to that. But right now working with Mike Thompson and the other representatives of the San Francisco Bay, we're creating a coordinated effort in which the additional money that we have put forward in the infrastructure jobs program, that that money would be in the San Francisco Bay dredging uh, programs. Uh, by all of us working together, we do have considerable political clout, including the uh, uh, senators. Uh, and we may, if we put it all together and work with all of you in developing a uh, consistent program year by year, certain channels being dredged consistently uh, and uh, even moving into the recreational uh, boating areas. All of that is possible and it's, we're working to make that happen. So a lot of issues in play. I'm very excited about uh, the prospect of uh, winning an election and coming back to uh, Northern Contra Costa or to Contra Costa County as I did represent them in the 90s uh, with both uh, El Cerrito, Kensington and Antioch. Uh, once again, returning to Contra Costa County and continuing my representation of Solano County. It's a very uh, challenging future that we have, but it's one that I find entirely possible my new uh, mantra really comes from the United Farm Workers back in the uh, 70s, and that is uh, their rallying cry, which was, si se puede, si se puede, yes, we can. And so we will, working together, and the Bay Council, Bay Planning Commission is uh, absolutely essential 
in pulling this off. Thank you so very much for the time. I'll stick around for a little while and then I've got to get on the road to some meetings that are taking place in the uh, next couple of hours. Uh, John, this is John Coleman. Thank you so much for your uh, poignant remarks. Uh, do we have any questions that have come in for uh, Congressman Garamendi? I believe we forgot to mention that at the beginning. Um, if you would like to enter in comments into the Q&A section, um, we will be filtering through them um, and asking them if you would like to uh, do it that way. We have about um, seven more minutes with the representative. Mm -hmm. so, Sophie, uh, you might just tell people, raise your hand, point at the yeah. camera and uh, we'll get some attention and maybe that will, while people are also writing up their comments or I mean, hitting, just, hitting the question. I just saw someone raise their hand, um, but now I can't seem to, to find where they went. Well, uh, well let, Sophie's looking for that, <laughs> Congressman. I would like to thank you for your remarks. And we know that we'll be working very closely with you on the shoreline interests that new shoreline interests that you are rep will be representing. Yeah. And you've always John, had a couple a of open mind. Yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, I had a meeting uh, Wednesday uh, with the, uh, the, the ferry system for the East Bay. And we were talking about uh, expanding that ferry system. We do have a piece of legislation in that would uh, provide operating money for urban ferry systems. We think that's likely to pass either in the uh, Coast Guard bill, which is passed out of the House of Representatives, uh, or the uh, Water Resource Infrastructure Bill, which we're likely to mark, mark up in the next uh, two weeks. Uh, if all that takes place, that will provide substantial amount of money for the, uh, uh, hopefully for the ferries, as well as for dredging and uh, shoreline restoration. One of the issues that uh, we want to push forward was one that I actually started back in the 1990s, and that was using the dredging material, which we used to call spoils, but now it's a valuable material uh, for the restoration of the wetlands. And this will be particularly important as we move to uh, sea, sea level rise uh, and the maintenance of the uh, extraordinary uh, wetlands that are in the San Francisco Bay Area and, and also up into the Delta. Uh, the ferry system, we're looking at the potential of expanding the ferry system uh, further east in Contra Costa County. I would expect that, I know the city of Hercules is talking about an intermodal uh, operation there. Uh, working with the uh, Capital Corridor uh, trans uh, train system, uh, buses, and the ferries uh, operating in that area, serving the uh, Pinole and Hercules area. Uh, the city councils are moving quickly on that. I, I want to put one thing in, in place here. The, uh, the new Infrastructure Jobs Act has a significant amount, of, well, $1.2 trillion, the largest infrastructure program ever. In that infrastructure program is a specific allocation for bridges. I'll let that hang out there. Uh, there are certain bridges in the Bay Area. The folks in the uh, San, uh, Richmond San Rafael Bridge are talking about some uh, modification, back lanes, and the like, all of which is possible. That is going to require a coordinated effort uh, beginning at the local level with the local transit agencies, uh, then the counties and then the Metropolitan Transit, it'll work up in a prioritization basis through that way. So the MTC um, and the local agencies working up through the MTC need to put all of the transportation infrastructure issues in play now and to set your priorities and then get the MTC to, uh, to move on that. Uh, and there's specific pots of money that are available. Also a specific pot of money uh, for um, rail crossings. I've talked to the Port of Oakland about this and whatever comes of uh, development at the Port of Oakland, uh, there is a major problem with the rail 
uh, system in that area interfering with um, foot traffic and highway traffic and truck traffic. And uh, for, the, uh, for all of you, keep that in mind uh, for the Port of Oakland, that is going to have to be resolved. If there is going to be a, uh, um, a stadium at the Port of Oakland, uh, these grade crossings are going to have to be addressed. I would turn your attention to a project I worked on in the 1990s uh, in Los Angeles. And that was the separation of the rail lines out of the ports uh, into uh, the Eastern area of Southern California in what was called the uh, corridor, the uh, Alameda corridor. Uh, and uh, that was a major project, but uh, untangled the uh, highway truck and pedestrian traffic from the rail traffic. And this is a significant issue at the Port of Oakland today. And if that stadium is built, it'll be even a greater uh, issue. Okay, time for a couple of questions. Yes, so we have uh, one question about the ferry map. Um, will the ferry map include the Caltrans ferries in the Delta? Well, there's one that came right. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's the upper reaches of the bay. Um, uh, if we're successful with the, uh, the funding mechanism, it's a, uh, a billion dollars a year spread out across all urban ferries. In the uh, Senate version of the infrastructure bill, uh, the senators who uh, understand about bringing bacon home uh, drop the urban ferries and put in what was known as the rural ferry program. This is essentially uh, uh, Puget Sound to uh, all of the Alaska ferry system. Wonderful for Alaska, but they didn't put in the urban ferry system. We go, we're going back now to put that in. If we're successful, then that money will be available for the Caltrans ferry in, uh, in the Delta. Ferries, and I think there's two uh, in the Delta that have been uh, shut down. The other uh, thing here is for, uh, is for all of you to, uh, and, and certainly for the expansion of the ferry system in the Bay, all of the ferry system in the Bay. It is a subsidy for the ferries is what it amounts to, operational subsidy. Uh, we're also working on a, um, a subsidy for uh, a funding mechanism for the uh, construction of ferries. And this ties back to the hydrogen uh, systems that are being discussed in the Bay Area, the hydrogen powered ferries using uh, hydrogen as a fuel for uh, fuel cells and then electric drives. <clears throat> All of that is possible. Uh, it is in play now. Hopefully it'll come to pass. Uh, do keep your eyes on the large infrastructure bill. There is a very, very large amount of money in there for port development and for, dis in, for untangling uh, the uh, truck systems from the highway systems and uh, creating efficiency on that. I look forward to working with all of you. Uh, any other questions? I think we have, we do have so much interest because you touched on, <clears throat> excuse me, topics that every single person here today is very interested in. And I think what Sophie's gonna do is gather all those comments and get them to you and we'll have a chance for you to respond. Um, well, Jocelyn, why don't, uh, let's put together another yeah. Zoom event for those people that want to, uh, to ask those questions. Uh, we've, we've become accustomed to Zooming. It's a very efficient mm -hmm. way. If we try to get to the other person, it'll be several months, but uh, right. add them up and uh, we'll do a Zoom yeah. event. I'd like to do that. Great. Yes. Thank well, you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. And also, thank you very much for your leadership and strength uh, in guiding it. the Bay Area. We really appreciate it. Well, you've got a great team of uh, representatives in the area. All of us are working yeah. together on these things. Thank, Thank you so you. very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is also no stranger to Bay Planning Coalition, Mr. Eric Saperstein, president and founder of ENS Resources. We always enjoy his informative and I will say sometimes entertaining presentations on legislative and regulatory affairs. We're thrilled to have him back at the Spring Summit. Today, Eric is going to provide an update on the 2022-23 federal budget and funding. So Eric, take it away when you're ready. Thank you, Jacqueline. Can you hear me okay? 
I can hear you great. Excellent. Well, thanks, everybody. Good to be back with you. Um, I want to deviate from the presentation as Sophie or Cameron put it up. I just want to acknowledge uh, Representative Garamendi. He's a fierce advocate for the issues that BPC con is concerned about. And most important from our perspective, he sits on the key committee, Transportation Infrastructure, dealing with the Water Resources Development Act. And that is, as he mentioned, in progress as we speak. And I'll get to some of the high points, at least in the Senate, because the Senate bill has been done in a moment. OK. So the limited time I have today, I'm gonna to go through a number of issues and then if time permits, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Next slide, please. So we're in the last half of the uh, congressional uh, second session and uh, actually the last few months of this Congress uh, leading up to the elections. And as far as things go, um, there's a number of issues stacked up, if you will, uh, the ones I want to touch on today are the Water Resources Development Act, Infrastructure uh, Investment uh, and Jobs Act implementation. I also want to talk uh, briefly about Build America, Buy America, because it does have an impact on everything that is funded by the federal government at the local level and the state level. And then I want to touch briefly on fiscal year 2023 and the reconciliation process because that will have an impact too at, during the lame duck as our guest. Uh, next slide, please. And as we go to the next slide, I do want to say a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is that a lot of what we will talk about today will be influenced by those two cheerleaders you saw on the previous slide, Senator Manchin and to a certain degree, Senator um, Cinema who holds sort of the veto in the Senate right now with getting things done. The other thing I wanna talk about very quickly is the White House priority that is now the administration's priority overall, which is captured by the environmental justice for overburdened communities. This is a slide that illustrates, you know, what pieces of the puzzle are in play and whether it's FY22 president's budget and now the 23 budget, WERDA, um, climate change or equity efforts as executive orders, and most importantly, the Justice 40 initiative. What I want to talk to you about as we go through these slides is to keep in mind that this Justice 40 initiative, um, along with all these other little um, circles of uh, labels, permeates the policymaking process at the federal level. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, the Water Resources Development Act of 2022. Um, so the core uh, mission of this, any bill that's enacted by Congress looks like it's going to be a core centric mission driven bill, uh, limiting sort of add-ons until maybe uh, later in the year when the House and Senate vote on any kind of final agreements. Resiliency and environmental justice probably are going to be the core cornerstone, if you will, of a word of 2022 bill. And while we don't have a House bill yet, we do have a Senate bill that was marked up last week. For those of you who are taking notes, that bill number is S4136. And I just want to sort of highlight the top issues in that bill. Um, resilience, a priority to uh, direct dollars into projects that can deal with storm, sea level rise, um, anything that can sustain and make facilities at the core is driven to address, uh, hardened, if you will, to the impacts of climate change. Um, another thing that you will see in the uh, Senate bill and we'll probably see in the House bill is a reorienting of priorities directed towards underserved communities. In the Senate bill, we see a whole host of programs that provide for higher spending levels for underserved communities to be um, supported and, and funded. Uh, we'll also see for the first time an interesting study where a where the I believe it's the General Accounting Office is going to review how the Corps of Engineers invests its dollars on a geographic basis to determine if the Corps funding is going across the country or if it's concentrated in certain areas. And that will have an impact, I think, in the budget making process going forward. And then I do want to say one point in the Senate Word of Bill, which we'll probably see uh, enactment when they do a Word of Bill during the lame duck as far as a final agreement is reached. 
There is an explicit policy now in the Senate bill that says it's the policy of the United States government for the United States, for the US Army Corps of Engineers to give priority to resilient pro, resiliency projects. And if, if you think about that, that is probably the mo one of the more important policy statements in the Senate bill, because it says basically, we wanna emphasize that as the Corps goes forward dealing with these, with these issues, that whether it's um, a sea level issue or levee repair, or what have you, it's got to it, the core's project priorities have to focus on risk management from storms. And so I think that's something we'll be looking forward to seeing how that is implemented. And then finally, um, with respect to uh, the drought that is impacting the West at writ large, but particularly in California, uh, there is within the Senate water, water bill a Western water needs uh, provision, which is essentially saying uh, we want the Corps of Engineers to work more aggressively to leverage the investments of the um, of, of reservoir of dams and flood safety programs to ensure that uh, if there's a way to help support Western water needs, the Corps of Engineers plays a role. So I think generally speaking, any word of bill that is enacted into law will focus on climate resiliency and all that that covers, as well as environmental justice priorities. Next slide. So reconciliation and fiscal year 2023 appropriations. Um, reconciliation is not dead yet. Um, it, it is going to probably come back in a piecemeal approach. Uh, the, 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 the Congress will sort of wrestle with that as part of the 2023 appropriations bill. Uh, funding wise, but I think what we're going to see with respect to reconciliation is maybe some more uh, investments in resilient energy programs, translate that into solar, alternative energy in general. There's an effort right now going on in the um, effort to deal with the China competes bill in the House and Senate to deal with some limited tax uh, reform extenders to uh, promote uh, co competition better. That seems to be getting some pushback. So we could see these types of extenders included in any kind of reconciliation bill. And then finally, technical fixes to the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, there may be some needs to deal with how uh, federal funding is uh, obligated and sent to projects throughout the country. So we might see something in the uh, reconciliation and or the fiscal year 23 appropriations bill. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so infrastructure investment and implementation. So a couple of thoughts I just want to leave you with. The Congressman mentioned the tremendous amount of money that's in the uh, bill or the now the law, but just for the sake of sort of what's out there, $65 billion overall for water infrastructure needs, a billion and a half dollars for drought, a billion dollars for water recycling, and a huge amount of money for cybersecurity. Uh, all of these things, uh, either directly or indirectly impact the uh, San Francisco Bay, Re Bay Area region. And I think that at the end of the day, uh, we will expect to see that the federal agencies will start pushing that money out the door in the coming months uh, in anticipation of getting that, the first slug of money that was provided uh, to um, the state and local agencies. I would also emphasize a lot of this money is going through the state and then to the locals. Um, and then finally, I just want to touch on Build America, Buy America, because I think it's a very important piece that you need to be aware of, particularly if you're doing any kind of work with federal assistance. Under the uh, infrastructure law, there is a section uh, entitled Build America, Buy America. And this um, section basically says the following, all manufactured products must be made in America if in fact they're going to benefit from federal investments in the infrastructure law. And this includes, if you get anything, whether it's chemicals, pipes, um, pumps, whatever it is, it, that is a manufactured product, that is subject to a requirement that it has to be made in America in order to be used through the infrastructure law. And also I wanna emphasize that it doesn't end with the infrastructure law, this will be the new policy for federal financial assistance, be it through grants, loans, 
or any other sort of mechanism to get federal assistance to a project. Going forward, uh, this will be the, the rules of the road to uh, invest federal dollars into a project. And if that federal money goes into a project, the entire project is subject to build America, buy America mandates. That being said, for purposes of anybody's out there with a project right now that's wondering, you know, well, are we going to have to comply with this? It appears that the administration, the federal agencies are going to use their authority to grandfather ongoing projects into this program in the sense that they will not be subject to compliance. That if you have an ongoing project, uh, and that could be defined as either designed and ready to roll, or it's being built already, but it hasn't been completed yet, they will not be impacted by this new mandate to use manufactured products in the United States. The other thing I would emphasize is uh, the effective date is literally two days from now, May 14th. Um, we expect, based on some of the federal agencies' activities, including the Department of Transportation, uh, that there will be a request for a 180-day delay in the compliance date. So at least for the next six months, we expect most, if not all, the federal agencies to delay, to delay the compliance date for Build America, Buy America. But going forward, if you have a project and it is going to receive federal assistance, irrespective of whether it's a facility or, or a dredging project or what have you, the, if there's manufactured products used in the project, they will have to be American made unless there is a waiver. And the waiver process is gonna be very constrained and limited, targeted, and so I would not rest too comfortably and say, well, we'll get a waiver. You really will have to carefully consider how you want to go forward if you get financial assistance. Next slide, please. So very quickly, the time that I have, I just want to look at the congressional outlook for the next six months. International events, clearly Ukraine and what's going on there and NATO will, will certainly influence things. And since the time I um, mentioned, uh, wrote this up, I think abortion and the Supreme Court ruling to be is going to impact what Congress can get done. But it comes down to midterm elections, midterm elections, and midterm elections. So quickly go through the next slide. So everybody talks about what's going to happen with respect to control of Congress, which will impact the federal funding stream also and projects and what have you. Bottom line is this historical perspective. You've all heard the storyline that the party, president's party gains or loses seats in the House. You can see this in this slide. In 2018, the Republicans lost 40 seats. In 2010, the Democrats lost 63 seats. And, um, you know, and similarly in the Senate, you see where in 2014, uh, the, the Democrats lost nine seats in the Senate. And in 18, uh, the uh, Republicans picked up a mar an incremental two seats leading to ultimately where we are today with a 50-50 Senate. Bottom line is this, the numbers don't look great for the, for the president's party, the Democrats right now in the House, it's a four seat majority, um, but uh, with redistricting and, and other factors at play like inflation, uh, the chances are, I won't say, um, better than even, I'd say they're a little above better than even that the House could flip. It's a question of whether the House flips by a handful of votes or it stays in Democratic control by a handful of votes. Uh, I don't see a massive blue, blue wave or, or it's called a, a red wave with a blue receding wave uh, in the elections just because it's everything is so topsy-turvy right now, it's very hard to call it. Although a lot of people think there would be a red wave. Uh, next slide. And here's probably my favorite slide. Voters are deeply divided. You, didn't, you don't have me telling you something that you don't know, but I would say the following with this. If you look at back in October of 21 on this slide, Democrats had a 44 point advantage to the 41 point advantage of the Republicans. Go forward to today, this is March 22, courtesy of uh, 538. You see that it's almost, flipped 44.8 for Republicans, 42.7 for Democrats of who would who should control uh, the House of Representatives. 
Back in 21, the Democrats took control. I think, you know, this sort of makes an argument that what, while we don't know the total vote distribution of the majority, it looks like the Democrats are gonna have an uphill battle to take control, keep control of the House. Next slide. So John, um, again, this is a quick summary of where we're at. I, I would be happy if time permits to provide any answers, any questions anybody has. I'm sorry, Jacqueline, um, um, and I'll end there, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, that was excellent as always. And again, you win the award for the most entertaining slide visuals. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but we have been receiving questions. So what we're going to do is BPC staff is going to gather all the questions that are coming in for the speakers and for the panelists later, distribute them and then to, to the speakers that they relate to and then send them out to attendees. Um, we'll get that together as soon as we can. So please don't stop sending in your questions. We just unfortunately don't have time to go through them. So thank you again, Eric. Thank Our you. next speaker is here to discuss the role that social equity plays in the funding of regional projects. Social equity is definitely highlighted in the San Francisco Bay Area lately. And so we're very pleased to welcome Mark Northcross of NHA Advisors. Mark has an illustrious 40 year career in public finance and has some eye opening information to share with us today. As a side note, if you're a nature lover out there, you can reach out to Mark directly and ask about his century old hike and only hotel, in Marin County Parkland. I will be hitting you up about that later, Mark. So Mark, we're very excited to hear what you have to say. Please start when you're ready. Thank you, Jacqueline. Could we get the first slide uh, for my presentation? Uh, yeah, there is properly labeled Mark's wrong numbers. Just a little background in the municipal bond business where I've worked for 40 years, we typically only get paid when the bond deal closes. And so you would see, gee, climate change adaptation is an exciting opportunity. The more I've looked at it, the staggering costs and our two thirds vote requirements in California don't fit together. So I am not seeing a whole lot of deal opportunities here. So I am here to deliver some sobering information the chart you see there is something about what it really costs for sea level rise, focusing on nature-based solutions in the Bay Area. And there's been a number of studies done. We've had some projects done. I've done my best to collect them and the best wrong numbers I can come up with. Uh, you know, number one is, I just know Larry Goldsband's here, the BCDC did a great piece of work on coming up with some cost estimates for what it would take to protect the Bay from sea level rise. That's on the far right. Uh, then UC Berkeley published a major study in a, the Journal of Marine Sciences that did a pretty deep dive on that. That's to the next column to the left. We have the one and only Hamilton Field work done a number of years ago, which a lot of people consider a Cadillac project. But I, I always remind people it passed CEQA, passed NEPA, got funded and got built. So maybe a Cadillac, but it, uh, it did everything it needed to do to come out of the ground of the Bay Area. Then on the far left, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and Silicon Valley Water have broken ground on a very exciting project in the South Bay. Uh, the combined cost is shown there. Keeping this presentation short and cutting to the chase, I took the cost per mile, inflated it to $22, and then assumed it was a 30 year bond issue spread over all 2 million taxable parcels in the nine county Bay Area to come up with an average annual debt service cost per parcel. That is the bottom row in boldface. The best number we have are the, is the BCDC study from late last year. It's about a thousand bucks per parcel per year. For the electeds in the room, you know what the chances are of getting a two thirds vote on a thousand bucks per house in the Bay Area is. Then we move over to the Berkeley study. Hey, a mere $3,000 a year at their cost analysis. Okay, a pretty staggering number. And yeah, the Hamilton Field is definitely a Cadillac. That's over 7,000 bucks a parcel. Then if the Army Corps project with Silicon Valley water is an indication, uh, and it, they did pass CEQA, they did pass NEPA, and they got funded, that's 4,000 bucks a parcel. These numbers are staggering. I mean, I only have three slides here, but I want to diverge for a moment. We cannot be in silos. 
when you look at the snowpack of the West Slope of the Sierra turning into rain and looking at the cost for replacing our whole water supply system in California, you look at the cost of wildfire mitigation in the Bay Area and you add all those up, we may be in silos whether we're dealing with coastal flooding, water supply, or wildfire risk. Our constituents are not. They get all the bills. And when you look at the combined bill, which I don't have a slide on, it's even more staggering. Next slide, please. All right, I, the, I see that Allison Brooks from Bark is on the participants list and is making a presentation. So I, I have to give a shout out to Allison because she was the impetus for this slide. It's one of my favorite slides. Comparing under our great Measure AA SFBRA $12 a year parcel tax, which is doing so much good in the Bay Area, but essentially looking at it from a social equity perspective, okay? And that's probably, it's totally unfair. I know Amy is, is on this call as well. Comparing two areas that have major exposure to sea level rise, Facebook, I'm sure people have been past their, their gigantic headquarters complex at the foot of the Dumbarton Bridge, <clears throat> and West Oakland, also with a lot of significant sea level rise exposure. Let's look at it. Facebook is paying four bucks per acre per year. West Oakland's 100 dollars and change. Facebook contributes $500 and change per year to measure AA. West Oakland contributes a half million dollars per year to measure AA. So just hold that thought. I'm going to scale this up and then a couple of slides later as to what the implications of parcel taxes on the social equity side. When we get to the scale we need to get to for climate change in the barrier. And just remember the prior slide the best number I had of my wrong numbers was a thousand bucks per parcel per year. Okay, and we're talking, you know, this is look, just looking at $12 per parcel. Next slide, please. Another shout out to ESA. We are working with them on a SFBRA funded, Measure AA funded project for North Richmond. We call it the North Richmond Living Levy Project. And ESA is doing some great engineering work. And it's on a subject that is, as our congressman uh, just touched on and other people in this group are very concerned about, which is materials. Horizontal levees, living levees, nature-based solution for sea level rise adaptation require a lot of material. We had our great team at ESA basically come up with an analysis of the variation in cubic yards and material per linear mile. That range is from 40,000 cubic yards per mile. That was the low end that they could come up with to over 120,000 cubic yards per mile. It turns out, as a, as a non-engineer speaking, uh, one size doesn't fit all, fit all even when you're talking about nature-based solutions. The nature of the bay frontage, all of that determines even on a nature-based solution, how much material is required. And then there is the real ringer in the room, the 800 pound gorilla sitting at the Thanksgiving table. That is, we all want our horizontal levees to be additive, meaning that you can add to them in future years, the sea level rise keeps going up. Well, the more additive you make it, the more material you need when you first build it. And that's one of the ways you get to that 120,000 cubic yards per mile number. The other big ringer in the room was really brought out by the Berkeley study from a few years ago. And I know also a shout out to BCDC noted this as well. How many linear miles of Bayfront are we protecting? The Berkeley study came out with a range between 600 to 1200. And just if you, if you go into Google Maps and you, you know, try to press a drive around the bay, it's 180 miles more or less to drive around the bay. So with that scale of variation, you can see that you range from maybe 24 million cubic yards in the upper left-hand corner over to 150 million cubic yards. If you've ever talked to a materials handling person and you start throwing numbers like this at them, 
about sourcing it, number one, from thinking of dredging from the bay and then transporting it, they go into shock. These numbers logistically are frankly beyond imagination. And we need to deal with this. And I feel intuitively that these are major cost drivers. Next slide, please. All right, this is my last slide. And uh, I, I've gotten in trouble with some of my, my clients over the years for showing the picture on the right, but I feel it's real. It's a picture of the Yellow Vest riots in Paris uh, when uh, President Macron uh, went to a, a carbon tax on diesel fuels. And um, the, the reason why it's sitting here is that we've got that possibility here when you look at the absolutely staggering costs for sea level rise adaptation taken out of their silo and combined with all the other costs for climate change that we're dealing with. Remember the numbers I went through didn't even deal with climate change mitigation. So again, California, it takes a two thirds vote to do an exaction as a rule of thumb. Yes, there are back doors to get the simple majority, but they're, they're pretty limited. And I don't think they're really scalable for what we need to deal with here. Our best case going to the BCDC number, which I came up with at a thousand bucks a parcel, is 50% grant funding, 50% local share. Okay, that's 500 bucks a parcel being our best case. Again, there's gotta be electives in the room. What are your chances of getting a $500 a house approved on a two thirds vote? If we applied that to our West Oakland Facebook comparison, you're all sitting down, I hope, Okay, you've got West Oakland and our best case for sea level rise adaptation being exacted to the tune of $20 million per year while Facebook is paying 20,000 a year. So there is my bottom line, the last bullet on the last slide. The scale of climate change makes social equity and funding key to project feasibility. With, you know, West Oakland is going to revolt. A lot of the Bay Area is going to revolt if these are the numbers are looking at for funding climate change. So that's my pitch. And uh, I've probably run out of time. I'm going to defer to Jacqueline and the rest of the BPC team and what to do next, but happy to stop talking and turn it over. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, we are, like I mentioned, going to be gathering questions because they are coming in as you're speaking and distribute them with answers coming later. And just for everyone um, in the audience, we will be sending out the recording and slides, I believe, on Monday. So um, some of you have been asking. But Mark, I'd like to thank you. That was a very important perspective, and um, we really appreciated Although it is staggering, the data, it is very important to see that and um, get that perspective. So thank you very much. Next, we are pleased to welcome Mr. Warner Chabot, the Executive Director of the San Francisco Estuary Institute. Warner is undoubtedly one of our top regional leaders in environmental planning and policy. And he expertly weaves together state and federal coastal and energy issues. Uh, he's led movements for numerous landmark environmental laws and policies, but today he's going to tackle the topic of adaptation to sea level rise. Um, I was able to take a sneak peek at his slides, and I can say they are visually stunning, so I cannot wait to see what he has to say about them. Everyone, please welcome Mr. Warner Chabot. Warner, when you're ready, it's all yours. Right. Thank you. Um... I want to start just by introducing the, for those of you that don't know the San Francisco Estuary Institute, in a few words, we try to deliver science for people and nature. We're both a non-advocacy environmental research institute and a nonprofit environmental consulting firm. Our primary clients are land use and natural resource managers from local to federal level and a few business leaders like Google. For about 27 years, our 75 scientists and technical experts provided have provided independent objective science on issues from water quality to climate adaptation to designing GIS tools and other technology. These tools are intended to empower local leaders to monitor, assess, and visualize solutions to complex uh, landscape scale problems. Next. I wanna first acknowledge that we have the pleasure at SFEI of both learning and working uh, with many of you that are on this uh, meeting today. Uh, people that John Coleman and Bay Planning Team have assembled. 
you are really the experts, you're the creators, you're policy wonks, you're public servants, and you're change makers. And you've largely determined, the, you will largely determine the ecological future of this region. I thank you all for what you've done. More importantly, for what we collectively must do damn quickly, if we're gonna face our grandchildren and be able to say with pride rather than embarrassment, this is the world we're passing on to you. Next. I believe that the staff at SFEI and most of you in this meeting uh, can easily share what I think is an important common goal. And that is that the Bay Area can and should become a national model, if not an international model, of how a region of almost 8 million people living at the edge of the sea can adapt to the immense challenge of climate change and do so, I hope, with great vision, hope, and creativity. Next slide. Obviously, it's called the Bay Area for a reason. The Bay defines a great many of our communities. We exist as part of a really large and very amazing ecosystem. We also live, frankly, in a virtual bathtub fed by the largest estuary on the west coast of North America. And the water in this tub, this bay, this estuarine ecosystem is constantly rising. Next slide. If there's one single idea that should guide our adaptation efforts over the next couple of decades, it's this. We're interdependent. Whatever we do in any portion, especially any shoreline segment of this system, will directly impact and affect our neighbors and the rest of the system. Next. And compared to the rest of the planet, which in many cases seems to be going crazy, let's not forget that we do live in a virtual paradise, sort of the, the bubble of the Bay Area. Here's one true amazing fact that I learned when I joined SFEI. 500 years ago, when Columbus stumbled on a Caribbean island, the greater Bay Delta region was, the most, was among the most densely populated areas of human habitation in the entire Western hemisphere. Why? Temperate climate, unimaginable ecological abundance. Next slide. This map shows the communities that existed in the Bay Area pre-Columbus uh, landing. You can see that those who lived here before us on whose ancestral lands we now live included the Ohlone, the Coast Miwok, the Bay of Miwok, and the Patwin tribal communities. They all knew this truth. They lived a cultural lifestyle that maintained and enhanced the biological diversity, uh, so much so that when the Spaniards first came across the Bay Area, they commented and wrote about its park-like qualities. Today, those tribal uh, communities are considered extinct. Their descendants are, are not even yet recognized by the federal government as, as tribes. Next. Fast forward to today. The Bay Area is the global headquarters of Google, Apple, Twitter, Facebook, Facebook, almost every major tech and communications company that's transform, transformed how most of the planet accesses knowledge, communicates, works, and plays. Why here? Yes, of course, it's because some of the founders got their start here, but it's also the quality of life in this region, access to an amazingly rich and diverse natural environment. That's a major factor that attracts and makes people want to live here and stay here and work with these companies and why these companies have stayed here and haven't moved elsewhere, despite the amazingly high cost of living. Next. Yet, despite our ecological riches, we're all on the global climate change roller coaster. And the daily news drumbeat of news says it's happening faster and faster and it's getting worse and worse. And we're sleepwalking still through our response. While narrow, while we have a very, really narrow window to avoid a global catastrophe that has almost slammed the window shut on our fingers. Next. For the Bay Area, you know, we're seeing the impacts of drought, occasional flooding, and the horror of nearby wildfires. For those of us living in this one bathtub, the unique, a unique impact is the triple whammy of sea level rise, rising groundwater, and lowland flooding from more intense storms. Next. We've already mapped the areas at risk from sea level rise and flood risk. We're scrambling and we're behind the curve on mapping the unanticipated huge impact of rising groundwater. Basically, the rising groundwater issue is that as the seas rise, they put pressure on the 
many, many areas around the Bay Area where we have very shallow groundwater tables and that groundwater is gonna push up um, into the basements and um, in other, other, other infrastructure areas. Um, uh, the areas, the situation is compounded by the fact that many of these areas that have are subject to rising groundwater are recently are very low land areas. There were, used to be industrial, so they're highly often many of them are highly polluted. And guess what? That also happens to be where our most disadvantaged, underserved communities now exist. So next. So our entire urban infrastructure, our ports, our airports, our highways, our water treatment plants, as well as most of our vulnerable underserved communities lie in this path of this triple threat. Next. The U.S. Geological Service tells us that California's entire $150 billion of coastal assets are at risk from sea, of, of the $150 billion of coastal assets that are at risk from sea level rise and storm surges, two thirds or $100 billion worth are here in the Bay Area. Now, I want to sort of make a personal observation and a prediction. The observation is this. Back in the early 70s, when dinosaurs roamed the earth and men's fashion was at its lowest point in recorded human history, I was on a campaign team that passed the coastal initiative. Since then, I've observed that the coastal zone, be it the outer coast of California or the San Francisco Bay Area, is literally the Beirut Benghazi Baghdad of land use politics. There's a literal mountain of laws, agencies, lawyers, public interest groups that work in this zone. As such, land use decisions in this area move very slowly. I suggest that the Bay Area's ultimate challenge is to make the political and policy Aikido move to reverse this glacially slow decision-making trend and to dramatically accelerate the bold decisions that we're gonna have to make with, to work with nature to protect this zone. Next. My prediction is the Bay Area is lucky to have 10,000 engineers and about 10,000 scientists to help work on these issues. We're gonna need them, every one of them. However, the two real frontier areas I suggest where innovation and transformation is really needed is in the areas of governance and finance. With governance, how are we gonna get our 101 cities, our nine counties and multiple region, regional agencies to work with state and federal agencies to move faster and more collaborative on the regional solutions for what are essentially large scale, landscape scale, regional environmental threats. And to determine where are we gonna find the probable $100 billion that is likely gonna require to rebuild our entire infrastructure to survive to the, to the next century. Next. Now, yet, yet be, I, would, I wanna compliment, again, the people that are on this Zoom call because, because of your vision and your leadership, you, you know, we have a foundation of hope in this bubble of sanity in the Bay Area. In 1999, some of you helped write the Bayland Goals Report. That established a target to work with nature to protect and restore about 100,000 acres of Bayshore wetlands, both for their ecological value and, uh, for the, and the fact that they provide the most cost-effective and nature-based solutions to buffer our shore from sea level rise. In about 2015, a coalition of about 21 management agencies led by the Coastal Conservancy with science support from SFEI updated that 1999 Bayland Goals Report. The basic conclusion of the 2015 update was to use, well, I'll, I'll call it a highly scientific term, which was, holy moly, we've got to move a lot faster. Um, that report then laid the groundwork for the 2016 spectacularly successful uh, measure double A tax measure that's gonna raise $500 million for Bay Wetlands restoration. That passed by over 70% vote across nine counties. And as someone who's worked on political campaigns, I tell you 70% is off the charts. It's, it's, it's Putin scale uh, elections. It's not, it, it rarely ever occurs in democratic societies. This may have been the nation's first regional tax measure that specifically focused on climate change adaptation. So score one for the Bay Area sanity and our national climate leadership there. Next. That in turn led to a burst of local and regional adaptation planning. This graphic of almost three years ago shows just some of the areas where 
pro local projects are going on. If this graph were updated as of today, the number of dots would probably be, be four or five times as much. Next. Another big, I think, advance was funded by the Regional Water Board. Nonprofit folks stepped up. SFEI partnered with SPUR and collaborated, collaborated with local and regional planners to produce the Shoreline Adaptation Atlas. We recognize that about 90% of climate adaptation is land use planning, and about 90% of land use planning is still done under the authority of cities and counties. So we wanted to provide sort of as much environmental, regional environmental information in one format to empower those local officials to work across multiple jurisdictions to solve the land use issues within their jurisdictions, but recognizing that the impacts and the issues are regional in, in scope. Next. We divided the San Francisco Bay region into 30 what we called operational landscape units following a, a sort of a Dutch planning concept. Next. We compiled and mapped as many factors as possible. The Atlas probably has about 50 maps that provide more information than you would ever want to know about both ecological land use issues across the Bay Area. Next. And for, for each of these 30 um, OLUs, we created sort of an options map. It's not a blueprint, it's not a suggestion of you know, what you should do, but it's a suggestion of options that should be considered to how to work with nature and, and solve shoreline problems. Next. Last year, SFAI also released the Sediments for Survival Report. In this report, we wanted to quantify how much sediment is going to be needed to supplement the natural supply to maintain our bay wetlands and to avoid having them drown as sea level rise. Next. A fun but maybe disturbing fact is that the amount of additional supplemental sediment we're going to need is about 450 million cubic yards. Just to visualize that, this, this offers one option. Salesforce Tower, if you filled Salesforce Tower with mud, it would be 1 million cubic yards. We're going to need the equivalent of 450 Salesforce Towers to be laid end to end and located in our wetlands, the equivalent in sediment, if we're going to make sure that our wetlands rise over the next 80 years to keep pace with sea level rise. Next. Also last December, we made another big advance. Both the MTC ABAG and BCDC produce, produced their two critical regional adaptation strategies, respectively uh, the Bay Area 2050 report from MTC ABAG and the Bay ADAPT report from BCDC. Next. Funding, lots of it. Last year, the state and federal government passed major bills to fund climate resilience and infrastructure upgrades. I think the governor's budget last year had about 3.7 billion for climate adaptation, for climate resiliency. If you just consider the fact that California is one fifth of the state's population. So if we've got one fifth of that amount for resiliency, we should be getting somewhere in the range of 500 to 800 million dollars from the state government for climate resilience, specifically for climate resilience projects. And there's additional funds that are in the state budget for drought, wildfire, transportation uh, related issues. If you take the fact that um, the federal government's 1.2 trillion climate or 1.2 trillion um, infrastructure bill, California's 10% of the US population. So California should be getting about 120 billion of that money. One fifth of the population, it means that California or the Bay Area should be getting you know, quite a few billion dollars there. Um, we'll see whether that actually plays out next. So today, I think the Bay Area kind of faces a really major fork in the road. We've got two options. Option one is for our regions, 101 cities, nine counties, and multiple regional agencies to compete for those funds. For this option, I'm reminded of a final scene in the classical American historical documentary, Blazing Saddles. Next. I suggest that the, that, that option, if we follow it, is going to result in a chaotic divisive, unproductive food fight. Here's my best illustration of that food fight with the regional agencies and top hats and tuxedos and the lowly cities, counties, and CBOs uh, being the, the, the motley crew that's fighting over the funds. That's not a p avenue that I think is going to be very successful. Next. I suggest that we seriously consider option number two, 
I suggest that our regional agencies work overtime to convene and consult with the region's 101 cities, nine counties, especially the leaders in planning and public works departments um, and flood management agencies who are on the front lines of climate adaptation, as well as the community-based or organizations that represent um, you know, the many communities that are gonna need to be in, involved in this proposals in, 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 in funding solutions that are both local and regional. Instead of maybe 120 proposals being submitted to state agencies, what would happen if we actually sat down over the next few months and really worked hard and came up with five or six proposals? Let's not forget that the regional agencies that are handing out this money have a limited amount of staff. And if we do the heavy lifting and the hard work and the political challenges of trying to work out our issues, I think they're going to be much appreciative of us, the Bay Area, maybe submitting five or six or seven or even 10 proposals for funding versus uh, 100, 110 proposals. You know, one bold idea that uh, Jessica Fain, uh, the senior plan, the planning director at uh, BCDC came up with, she put a straw man, straw person proposal out there that said, let's ask for 130 billion or 130, sorry, 130 million, you know, right up front as one large strategic overarching grant, just to get the ball rolling, to build that dynamic trust and relationship between the cities, the counties, the regional agencies and, and, the, and the CBOs. I think that's a great idea that we ought to be exploring and, and considering further. I'd also note that the Bay Area has a variety of sort of informal networks. So there's BayCan, which is a collaboration of about 40 entities, mostly planning officials from local governments that have been working specifically to network and coordinate across the region. There's CHARGE, a collaboration that's comprised of the cities and counties, flood managers and public works directors. Those two entities should be heavily involved and engaged in working with the cities, the counties and the regional agencies to develop a region-wide strategy. I'd suggest also that two good examples of community-based efforts are in the Resilience by Design contest uh, back in 2017 and 18. Marin City had a project that they called it the People's Plan and the local coordinators worked to put the local community leaders through a, a several month training program in learning about ecological issues and planning and the community brought their local knowledge to produce a, a, read, a strategy specifically for that community that was, I think, brilliant and, and very far reaching. Secondly, the Bay Restoration Authority recently funded um, the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project to produce a uh, about a three month training program that was called the Alameda Shoreline Leadership Academy. Again, a process that took about 18 local leaders, put them through a training process, um, tr paid them for their time to do that training and to produce specific projects. They're looking now for funding for phase two of, of that effort to actually implement those projects. Those are just two good examples of the type of community-based bottoms up solutions that we are capable of doing in the Bay Area. Next slide. Um, well, this this was just a, 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 I got behind in my slides, I didn't do next. This was just some images from the uh, people's planning process in, in Marin City. Next slide. I further suggest that our local and regional state leaders work to try to streamline the permitting process. Uh, the old wisdom is that enviros would grab their pearls and clutch their throats and say, oh my God, you know, we, we can't, you know, streamlining is, is a horrible word. Well, if we're going to actually move forward and deal with shoreline issues, we're going to have to find a way of kind of building on the, the BRIT process that was established to try to speed up um, the wetlands development projects on a project by project basis. We need to be trying to apply that streamlining effort across the entire region. Uh, SFEI and, and the Public Policy Institute did a study and a, and a report that was produced about six months ago that offered specific ways to do that, that streamlining. Next slide. I think if we do these things, I believe we can become the international model for multi-jurisdiction and multi-agency collaboration. Next slide. I think the results will empower cities and counties on the front line of climate adaptation. It's gonna empower community groups. It's gonna build the necessary and central trust 
between the local and regional leaders that's going to be needed to solve regional landscape scale issues. Next. I think we can create shoreline areas that provide multiple benefits of increased recreation, increased wildlife habitat, as well as cost-effective shoreline protection from sea level rise. Next. As we become more urban, we'll give our grandchildren a more sustainable and ecological future. Next. I'm not suggesting that we all pray at the temple of nature-based solutions. There are dearly, you know, there are clearly places where gray infrastructure, tide gates, pumps are needed, but for the vast portions of the Bay, especially in the far North and the far South, these nature-based solutions have an enormous role to play and are the most cost-effective solution going forward. Next slide. This is the last slide. Bottom line, if we empower our cities, our counties, and our community-based organizations, we're going to create a foundation for a very bold and creative solutions going forward. I think a major step in this process is likely to occur in about a week from now on May 20th. That's when the governing board of the Bay Area Regional Collaborative is going to vote on a regional strategy between the regional agencies and local government. You may want to attend that meeting on, on May 20th of the BARC Regional Governing Board because there will be some big decisions made there about how we're gonna coordinate between regional agencies and local governments. So with that, I thank you for, again, for what all you have done and it's time to roll up our sleeves because we've got a lot of work and we have to move very, very fast or we're in deep trouble. Thank you. Thank you very much, Warner. Um, that was wonderful information and just beautiful, beautiful renderings of our San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with SFEI, I encourage you to go to their website or reach out to Warner. This was just a little bit of the information they collect and the work that they do. They're a great uh, organization in our area and a wonderful resource. So um, please utilize them um, as, you, as you can. So uh, thank you to our morning speakers. Very sincere thank you. Congressman Garamendi, Eric Saperstein, Mark Northcross, and again, Warner Chabot. Uh, that was quite a bit of important information, um, but we're not gonna slow down. Uh, I hope everybody has another cup of coffee ready because we are gonna keep moving. We are going to change it up a little though and start with our first panel. And we're gonna discuss the topic of planning strategies. Our moderator for this panel is Allison Brooks, Executive Director of the Bay Area Regional Collaborative, or BARC. We're honored to have Allison moderate this panel because she has extensive experience in coordinating planning strategies, um, including a focus on climate change through her work at BARC, and prior to that, for equitable transit-oriented policies throughout the country. So, Allison, we are very excited to have you here, and um, thank you for your time. The floor is yours when you're ready. Great, thank you so much, uh, Jacqueline. It's great to be here. Great lead in to um, robust conversation on this panel. I, I have the easy job of introducing a great uh, panel of wonderful speakers, uh, but I will just provide a quick lead in here. Um, I think sometimes planning gets a bad rap. Uh, all, you know, you hear the refrain and we've heard a little bit of it already. Um, you know, all we do is planning, we don't get anything done. And I think that can be a fair assessment. Um, but the thing is, uh, we need planning, we need to have the tough conversations, um, you know, create a table for everyone to work through the data, understand the lived experience of people and communities to get to the best strategies to address our, the challenges we face around climate hazards and managing risk and understand collectively the costs and benefits uh, of our choices and weigh those and ultimately, ultimately get to those really tough decisions. We have to kind of weigh a lot of things when we're talking about climate adaptation strategies in communities. Um, and, the, and what's exciting about this panel today is that planning needs to happen at all scales. It and it happens differently at different scales. Um, and, and the thing is we need, we need to understand the kind of planning that happens, whether it's at the state or at the regional agencies or in cities and counties and, uh, and often led and, and, and by community-based organizations. Um, and ultimately this is all about creating an enabling environment for the right strategies and interventions to take place on, in the ground and in the, on the ground and in communities in the right places. 
Um, and we've heard a lot today about uh, money and, and this increase in money that's flowing um, to support this work. Uh, and, it's, and it's our job in our region to make sure that money is flowing in an equitable manner and that it's flowing in a way that's impactful and delivers outcomes and that those strategies are developed through a um, inclusive process. So, um, you know, we're gonna start on the ground and then kind of move um, towards the, a little bit of a higher level with our panel today. And literally, um, you know, when you say in the trenches, I actually think Roger Leventhal actually may work in trenches sometimes. So he's gonna, <laughs> he's going to start us off and talk about the work um, that he's doing from a public works uh, engineering perspective. And then we have uh, Len Matterman who will talk from the county um, scale and the new agency that's been formed in San Mateo County. Virginia Calkins, who's trying to do kind of detailed project work. Um, and we'll hear, I'm excited to hear about that because I haven't heard all the details about that. And then um, my, board, my board chair, Amy Wirth, who um, does so many uh, great wears so many hats and does such tremendous work and has for many years in the Bay Area. So I'm going to hand it over to Roger and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time. If everyone takes their 10 minutes, we'll have plenty of time at the end for um, some com for some conversation, some questions. Roger, you're up. You can hear me okay? Um, let me see if this guy is right. We can't hear you. Oh, we can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you oh, go. I don't know why that, I guess that didn't work. Uh, waiting for the first slide. Go ahead and start. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Um, yes, I have been in many trenches and walked many wetlands, and I actually think there are people who would like to bury me still. Um, so today I'm going to talk just quickly about the challenges and barriers to adaptation. And again, this is the view from local flood control. So everybody who presents has a perspective or bias, depending on how you look at it. And today you're definitely going to hear from the, uh, you know, the I would say the local flood agency perspective. I'm usually the uh, Debbie Downer of these sorts of talks, but after hearing Mark <laughs> talk, I think I, we, I may uh, have competition. Um, so next slide. And I'm, I also represent Charge, and I just want to quickly uh, uh, Werner mentioned that Charge is we're the essentially the coalition of of uh, public flood agencies that ring the bay and that are responsible for the on the ground, um, you know, working out adaptation, you know, when you're in public works, you really are dealing with both sides, the local community and all their concerns, uh, often <laughs> very vocally presented and then trying to get projects developed, funded, permitted through a very difficult regime. So, um, and, you know, we do have some of the best consulting minds in the, in the world really in the Bay Area. And, we're the agencies that are really the experts in, in preparing the proposals, managing and running these sorts of projects. Charge is at its heart an information group too. So we have a series of technical papers that are coming out. Uh, the first one, which should be out soon, is on, um, we found that even among our agencies, there was no um, standardization of how every agency modeled uh, sea level rise and climate change. So we're putting out a guidelines document that describes the models and describes you know, not just the numbers to use, but how one lines up boundary conditions and such. So there's a lot of um, decisions in, in the weeds that are have to be made. And the, it, depending if you line your storm up, on, storm up on a rising or a falling tide, you might really get different numbers. So we're going to have a series of publications that we hope that will help. Um, and, and they should be provided to cities and towns that don't have the sort of flood engineering expertise that our agencies do. Next slide. So there's I, I was talking about real world challenges and there's so many and I only have a few minutes. So um, I'm, I just picked a few. Um, these, these are not even necessarily the biggest ones. And I would say that, you know, I could put together a list and we, we should have more time and, and talk to this, but everybody on this call and this webinar probably could and should uh, develop their own list of the biggest challenges and we should pass these around and then not shy away from the um, maybe the more difficult conversations because um, when we were planning this, John Coleman said, don't be afraid to be, you know, to bring up maybe a little more controversial subjects with the intent that um, we want this conference to really sort of move us forward or start, you know, engaging on the difficult questions. So first, from the perspective, you hear this a lot among the, the various 
uh, you know, public works type agencies is that, you know, we're in the public safety business. You know, we're providing uh, essentially flood protection to the built urban edge of the Bay Area. And that's just not a priority of any of the permitting agencies. So, um, so that I think is something that needs to change. It needs to be a, now made something where, you know, we're not developers, we're not um, building shopping centers or such on the, in the Wellens, we're trying to provide a, a, um, a public safety benefit to the edge. And yet, you know, there's no really distinction. And I don't think it's, I think it's just the way the uh, permitting and agency, the regulatory process is set up. Um, uh, real work challenge number two is actually, I think, you know, a misunderstanding of the flood benefits of green approaches. There, you know, we at Charge and, and I have a long history of actually designing and building wetlands. They do a great job working with the landscape to damp waves, which is super important, basically important. We should do them wherever we can, but they don't actually stop sea level rise flooding. So in a horizontal levee, it, you know, maybe the levee part does in the back, but the slope, you know, dampens waves, extremely important, critically important, but we need green and gray and we, we need to really understand from a, a pretty practical level and not a cartoon science level where you know they um are applicable or not and not you know convince ourselves that we can provide flood protection in all areas with just uh solely green approaches um and then of course uh, there are regulatory issues the permitting requirements and costs that sometimes are so onerous and that i think people should understand that um, public agencies are you know we don't have rate payers typically we're we're just on Prop 13 property tax, so we don't have unlimited staffing and, and resources. So projects that are made too expensive, when you just get down to it, complicated, expensive, just don't happen. And I think we're seeing some of those cracks in some of the projects, certainly Marin, where we're not able to move forward um, due to costs, um, even for projects that I think everybody believes would be good. We often see a disconnect in agencies between the people that are setting the goals for like say beneficial reuse of sediment and those are getting permits. So I think a better alignment on, on that so that we can, um, you know, and we may have to take more chances on things and allow things to go forward um, that, you know, without 100% certainty, but with a, with a pretty high percentage if we want to achieve these goals. And so I think we believe that achieving these goals should be a mission of the permitting agencies as well so that we become partners in it um, and trying to figure out how to make it happen and not sort of uh, less adversarial at times and how we get there. So again, you're getting the view from the people applying for permits. I'm sure other people providing them have their own, um, but there, we do often see a disconnect when we go to these myriad of conferences between, you know, we want to benefit your sediment, but then when you try to go to do it, um, it's difficult. So I need to move forward. Uh, the costs and impacts are moving. Phil, Mark, talked about it. Um, and I think he actually underestimated the costs. Um, uh, most people, when they build levees, design the ecotone part using the locally derived muck, essentially, because um, it's cheaper. Uh, and then the levee core, and we're seeing at some sites, like at Sears Point, where, uh, you know, nature still, there's still erosion. And we're looking at natural ways but um, to combat that. But you can build these flatter side slopes, but we're still doesn't mean that the maintenance costs and such are still, I don't, I'm not even sure factored into the cost of the ad. And finally, we're, we're still building homes. So we have this disconnect um, because housing is a priority. We're still putting things in what I would call the sea level rise zone that maybe 30 years from now, we're gonna have to uh, figure out how to protect or retreat. Um, the picture is from a thin lift that we've done in Novato. So we've been trying in Marin to be you know, proactive, but uh, it's been difficult. So next slide. I want to talk about one real world example just very quickly, which is the idea of flooding up creeks, where it's the number one type of flooding, uh, really. It's not that many people right along the shoreline. Oh, I got to say, sea SRL, sea level rise, sorry. Um, and, uh, and so we, it's not hard to understand how we got here. We've had a lot of development on our marsh plains and flood plains. This is Galenus Creek and Marin. And, but there really aren't nature-based solutions other than retreat. Um, so uh, there are situations where tide gates and more traditional engineering is needed. Um, and, you know, it, it's next to impossible to fund. And, and the scale and the costs are so extreme. So to think that we can do it all just with uh, wetlands is, is, from an engineering perspective, I think, incorrect. Um, we can do a lot of it. We need to do both. But we also need to have grant funding for what we call plumbing, high-tech plumbing levees, pumps, and gates. 
And if we're going to build a lot of levees, horizontal levees or otherwise, we're going to need a lot of pump stations. And if, we're, if that's our future, then we're going to need to design around that. So we really need both solutions, but let's not forget the gray part um, and, uh, and that is required to make these systems work. And we have lots of legacy conflicts that that would take an hour. So next slide. Oh, the, all right. This is just a, I don't have control of the mouse, but that little green line kind of cutting diagonally, that's the main drainage for Mill Valley. And just an obvious photo of how developed the floodplains and marsh plains are um, that we're dealing with in many of the urbanized parts of the Bay Area. This is the tidal channel. So the, a lot of it is tidal. So the Bay high levels will push up. It will inhibit stormwater drainage. Uh, we met, touched upon groundwater. So if we're pumping systems now, we need to uh, decide if we're going to be pumping base flow. Um, so the next one's my last slide, and I'm hopefully finished right on time. So the final question really I will pose quickly is, are we really preparing the Bay Edge for sea level rise flooding of the urban part of the edge? Well, I mean, we in on the engineering groups, we, we're kind of like that kid in the photo with our fingers in the dike. Only the dike will keep getting higher and higher as the sea level goes up. I think in scattered locations, we're building levees, mostly more the South Bay. Len's going to talk about his project. The idea of these considered bathtub impacts is a good question. You know, the idea that the bay has a certain size. To my mind, at some point, what we're doing is um, uh, we're building dams, essentially, at the bottom of the watershed with the water on the outside and the people on the inside. But any way you look at it, when and if perhaps they fail, we, we built, say, a series of, say, mini New Orleans, and we're heading in that direction. If that's our vision, which I'm not sure it is, then we're going to need a lot of money, a lot more money than Mark talked about for pumping, which is uh, extremely, I would say, at equal or higher than maybe some levy costs. Next, push next. And the old days are gone. So the old days when you could, you know, build a dam and celebrate with a cigarette. Well, we're not really in that world anymore. It's much more multi-dimensional projects, much harder to do these sorts of things. And yet the costs go up and up. So nobody's mentioned it yet, or I think Warner maybe alluded to it, but we're any engineer can only protect so much. So we're going to end up really heading to how we decide to either retreat, so hit next. Um, and you know, there's some that's the old school retreat, but you need a very powerful client for that. And typically we have to retreat the people and not the water, or accommodate to hit next. And you know, again, there's old school approaches, but we're gonna have to find it, figure out how we can redevelop rebuild and protect the shoreline under these conditions. And I am, even though I'm the engineer and I, I fully understand that retreat is not eminent domain, retreat, these sorts of things are, are, are very emotional processes, community driven, very, very difficult. So the answer to the question I posed is a question mark because I think it's mixed at best. And um, I think it'd be interesting to have other people's perspective of how well we're really doing in that preparation. And that's it. Thank you, Roger. We're all going to need a cigarette after your <laughs> um, um, No, just kidding. Um, no, uh, we'll have, hopefully everyone has a chance to think about some questions. Um, and I'm going to hand it over. The next uh, presentation is with Len Matterman from One Shore Lang, Executive Director. And I think he'll be a nice um, transition from Roger's very uh, insightful and provocative uh, presentation. So I'll hand it over to you, Len. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Allison and Roger. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully you can see the first slide, the title slide. Is that right, Allison? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, well, good to see uh, everybody virtually, and um, thank you for having uh, having this panel and for including um, One Shoreline in it. So in uh, One Shoreline is a short version of the name of our agency, which is the San Mateo County Flood and Sea Level Rise Resiliency District. So over the last uh, especially half decade, but actually before that, uh, there have been several studies about the vulnerability uh, of various counties in the Bay Area to this issue. Um, some of that was discussed earlier today. And, uh, and in San Mateo County, there have been two very specific vulnerability assessments done. And uh, the first of that, the first of those was in uh, 2018. Um, there were other studies that looked at our vulnerabilities related to transportation, 
uh, housing. Uh, that was a Stanford study there that shows the orange bar for San Mateo County um, being below median income housing, especially vulnerable. Our county uh, grand jury did a, a couple of summary reports in the last five years, and we just released a study of the Pacific Coast side of our county. So all of those point to extreme vulnerability for San Mateo County. Um, like Marin and San Francisco, we have both a Bay side and a Pacific Coast side. Um, and then relative to other counties in California, San Mateo County has the most people and property um, at risk. And uh, and so here's a here's a snapshot of the of the county shoreline um, extending from Brisbane to East Palo Alto uh, on the Bay side. And the way that we talk about it, because not all of our residents work and live on the Bay, um, is that if you drive on Highway 101 or on the coast side of Highway 101, um, and and if you're basically east of, of Skyline Boulevard, um, if you flush a toilet, you drink water from Hetch Hetchy, you use electricity natural or natural gas, or you like our beaches and marshes, um, this is an issue that that is important to you. Um, so in state in 2019, there was state legislation authored by um, Assembly Member Mullen to create uh, one shoreline, the county's countywide. Uh, flood and sea level rise resiliency district as an independent government agency to build resilience to the water related impacts of climate change. And so what we think about are the threats, uh, not as kind of a traditional flood control, so to speak, threat of, of trying to achieve 50 year of flood or, or a 100 year event, um, but looking at uh, what we're seeing as the new normal. And this winter is a great example of it where we had two major atmospheric rivers and otherwise uh, largely drought. And so how do we deal with both of those conditions um, as well as of course, sea level rise. So taking a different view of the threats, a look different view of the objectives. Uh, many of our channels are lined with concrete uh, as is aspects of our shoreline on the bay. Um, and can we think of water as an asset to our communities rather than just a liability that we have to wall off and be separated from? Um, and then a different view of geography. Uh, our work is uh, multi-jurisdictional. Um, we think uh, on the bay side for our bay program of all 53 miles of shoreline and how do we integrate uh, protection, habitat and recreational trails across the jurisdictions. This is a snapshot of most of San Mateo County. Um, on the bay side, you'll see several different projects either in planning or design or construction. Um, and our agency is tasked with kind of knitting together an aligned and connected um, protection for, for all of those agencies. And uh, two of the projects uh, that, that we're starting up now uh, are on Burlingame Millbrae. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and then all of Redwood Shores, which is Redwood City, uh, San Carlos and Belmont. Um, so we think uh, the way we think about our resilience projects, they should be large enough uh, to address connected problems for a long time, decades. Um, so we're not just looking for getting people out of the current FEMA flood zone. We're assuming a large amount of sea level rise, uh, but this should be small enough to be manageable by one lead agency. Uh, capital projects like this can't be uh, run by committee. Um, there has to be a lead agency, of course, under CEQA, but there also has to be a lead agency driving the design. And that's challenging, of course, when you're crossing uh, multiple jurisdictions or working with private entities. Um, we focus on projects that build long-term value, as I mentioned, multi-jurisdictional, as I mentioned, multi-benefit, as I mentioned, including uh, habitat restoration and trails, as well as, of course, protection, um, and projects that are locally supported uh, with clear roles for all the different agencies. And then um, finally on the slide, uh, we're focused on and Warner touched on this as well as Roger, uh, unlocking the keys to building resilience. Um, in terms of funding, our first project as, as a construction project is now complete. We were handed a project that was in planning for over a decade um, and in one year because it needed a lead agency to bring together uh, three cities and the county, uh, relatively small project, um, we pushed through the a funding agreement, an MOU among all the parties, where, um, whereby all of them contributed to the construction. It was about a $10 million project, so relatively small in our terms. And, um, and uh, we also brought together the, the necessary uh, agreements 
towards land rights that cross two cities in the county, as well as um, agreements uh, around uh, the, in the secret document um, that affected all the jurisdictions. So we also think of financing. And uh, for us, financing, the way I think about it is that uh, developers and investors behind those developers um, have multiple benefits from resili building resilience. It reduces their uncertainty. Of course, for a developer, that's a huge issue. Um, reduces operational costs, reduces insurance requirements and insurance premiums. Um, it also increases things. It increases land values, increases project lifespans. Um, it increases bond ratings and ESG ratings for those investors. Um, so there's a lot of benefits, financial benefits to the development community. And what we're trying to do is transfer that into capital for resilience. And um, we're first working on this. We're first working to achieve this um, in the city of Burlingame and exporting this model to other cities now by putting land use and land rights in service of the solutions. Um, finally, I'll talk about permitting. Uh, Roger talked about this as well, of course, uh, that not only should our projects at flood resilience, uh, climate resilience be recognized as a societal benefit. And, and as Roger said, rather than maybe building a, a, a shopping mall in the Bay or something like that, um, but also just the general uh, frame of, if you think about it, permitting uh, regime that we have today was established literally 50 years ago in the early 1970s. And that was under a static environment. We now have a non-static environment, a very dynamic environment. And, um, and, the, and the permitting regime needs to reflect uh, the changes that we have seen and, and continue to see and will see uh, in, the, in the climate space. Um, I'll focus on one project uh, for a minute. Uh, San Francisco International Airport, you probably see in the middle of this image, surrounded by uh, four cities, South San Francisco, San Bruno, Millbrae, and Burlingame. Um, when SFO de was developed about 100 years ago, um, the creeks were generally rerouted around the airport. Um, and, and these channels uh, now flood, uh, either from big rain events or uh, high tide events. And of course, with sea level rise, that will get worse. Um, here are some images from the past 12 months um, in various areas. Uh, and so uh, SFO has developed a uh, planned uh, protection for its bayside. And, uh, and they'll be coming out with an environmental document uh, relatively soon. Um, and they have kind of fundamental options to complete the project. One option is to construct west side protection along its entire west side. Um, another option to that is to tie into adjacent protection uh, that one shoreline is working on to the south and the north of the airport. And so we have, uh, been, had several meetings with leadership at SFO in recent days, including yesterday, um, to talk about uh, how we share technical information, um, costs, environmental mitigations, and land rights uh, between our two projects. Mm -hmm. And our objective for a project is, um, is the FEMA 100 year plus six feet of sea level rise, and that's equal uh, in our area to about 10 feet above today's high tide. So I think this is my final slide. Uh, what is building long-term resilience look like. And for us, it's really a combination of, of three really important factors. And, uh, and the first starts with planning and zoning. And Warner talked about how planning is, is such a key element of building resilience. Um, in the city of Burlingame, they were developing their new zoning ordinance. Uh, they were updated. The last time it was updated was in the late 60s. So it had a lot of uh, important updates to do. They reached out to one shoreline in the summer of last year, 2021, to say, uh, how do we incorporate, how should we incorporate uh, sea level rise into our new zoning ordinance? Um, and, uh, and we spoke with entities around the country that uh, had made progress on this issue. Um, Georgetown Law School is an important repository of this data, um, but entities in Florida and Virginia and, and Massachusetts and New York and Hawaii, um, all, we, all, we learn things from all of them, and we put it into a new uh, short section of the zoning ordinance um, that includes a sea level rise overlay area and a map of future conditions 
um, whereby within the yellow zone that's in the sea level rise overlay area, um, areas at risk of sea level rise, basically, which is from the bay to the Caltrain tracks in, in the area of Burlingame, um, there are requirements for uh, new developments to have a buffer zone from the bay um, and from creeks for new developments to incorporate protection infrastructure um, that is uh, meeting our objectives well above the current FEMA uh, water elevation uh, requirements related to first floor elevations uh, three feet above the FEMA ground uh, floodplain elevation requirements related to stormwater and uh, disclosure of sea level rise in real estate transactions. So you think about it, cities have requirements related to today's FEMA floodplain um, and they impose those on developments. Um, now the city of Burlingame is the first city in the Bay Area uh, to have requirements for tomorrow's floodplain. And we think that that's really important to, uh, to focus on these future conditions. Um, there, uh, a second piece, the second leg of this triad or stool uh, is opportunities for major developments along the water to contribute to adaptation solutions. And the next speaker in this panel, uh, Virginia Hawkins, is from a major development on the Burlingame shoreline that we've been working with and the city has been working with um, so that uh, their work is incorporated into the new regional project. And so our regional project with cities of Millbrae and Burlingame and connected to SFO analyzes and guides the solutions of the development community um, within this area. And there are very significant developments. There are other cities in San Mateo County that share these three issues of uh, updates to zoning or planning, key planning documents, general plans, specific plans, uh, major new developments coming in and a regional project. Those cities include uh, East Palo Alto, Redwood City, San Carlos, South San Francisco, and Brisbane. So most of our shoreline has these issues coming up. And it's important for us to, to show leadership on, on how to integrate these key um, opportunities for building resilience. And, um, and the, the, the Daily Journal article you see there is, is recent, it was from last weekend. And it's, it kind of talks about how um, the new project has begun and, and the people standing there include our state legislator talking, but also a, a county supervisor and the mayors of the two cities and the director of SFO. And, and we really are emphasizing that we need to bring the leadership together. And fortunately in this area that's occurring. So with that, I will uh, end my discussion and be glad to answer questions later. Thanks, Allison. Thank you, Len. That was um, wonderful. Thank you for your leadership and um, also just the leadership of San Mateo County. We're um, lucky to have a county that's really leading the charge um, on this work and uh, you know how we can bring that to scale around uh, across the rest of the Bay Area is, is important. Um, so I'm excited to hear you uh, give it, uh, help teed up uh, Virginia Calkins' uh, presentation, and she's going to uh, dig into some details about a, a project on along um, the shoreline. So Virginia, I'll hand it over to you. Great, and I got to get Len um, an updated drawing of our project. He's got a he's got a diagram of like six months ago. So I got I got to get him an update. Um, Good morning, my name is Virginia Hawkins. I'm a senior development manager with Divco West. And um, as a Bay Area resident, I appreciate the regional lens and the long-term outlook of others that have presented this morning. Um, but as a developer, I'm here to talk about operating on the scale of an individual near-term project. Um, on behalf of Divco West and our partners, I wanna thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit about our project, Peninsula Crossing and its associated shoreline infrastructure. So given the diversity of this audience, I thought I'd give a brief introduction of Divco West. We're a national real estate company active in the country's primary innovation markets founded here in the Bay Area nearly 30 years ago. We engage in ground up development nationwide, including some examples shown here. And we're not new to major infrastructure and complex public-private collaboration. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, for example, we're developing Cambridge Crossing, which is a 45 acre, 4.5 million square foot transit oriented mixed use development on a former industrial brownfield site. Um, that said, the Bay Area's critical focus on sea level rise resilience is a new and, and exciting opportunity for us. Our goal with Peninsula Crossing is to set the standard for resilient development in Burlingame and the broader Peninsula region, while at the same time fulfilling Burlingame's vision for this 12 acre bayfront parcel and building long-term protection for the community. 
The site today is largely paved and, and underloved. We took years to assemble multiple parcels to amass an area large enough to support a significant public realm and, and a robust life science cluster. We first brought this project to city staff for discussion during summer of 2021, and we subsequently learned about the city's priority to address sea level rise and their intent to incorporate sea level rise measures into the zoning code as Len was just describing. Hearing this priority prompted us to slow our application process while we coordinated with Len and with One Shoreline with the city stakeholders to better understand the goals and the new sea level rise measures. We engaged renowned shoreline engineering firm to design our project to reflect the priorities of the city and to incorporate shoreline protection at FEMA certified viable standards. Another site priority for us is connecting the Bay Trail. This is one of the few places in the region where the Bay Trail dead ends into a parking lot. So therefore we need to consider how to balance current recreational priorities with sea level rise resilience. We aim to provide a continuous pathway along the bay for residents and visitors alike and a network of trails to help connect people to the bay. Peninsula Crossing is at once a park, an urban plaza, a social space, a science hub. To achieve this simultaneity, natural landscapes are overlaid on top of constructed environments, creating a series of elemental layers between the natural and the built. Visitors can enjoy a cantilevered boardwalk for generations of watching planes land. Peninsula Crossing is a free and welcoming place, one where visitors and residents of all backgrounds and ages can enjoy moments for quiet contemplation, efficient bike commuting, or active recreation. It's a living lab. We hope to host public events and post helpful information that tells the story of bay resilience and sea level rise and invites ongoing discussion. Our protection design represents a spirited collaboration between shoreline engineers, construction experts, landscape designers, and habitat scientists. We wanted to achieve reliable, adaptable protection seamlessly incorporated into a natural park environment. Protection for the future cannot come at the expense of great park space for today. By integrating earth and berms into the landscape and burying protective walls where necessary, we're proposing a solution that feels like a coherent natural shoreline. This design also allows for maximum future adaptability. We're going to import soil at great expense and raise grades across the site to be well above the design flood elevation. We will build a continuous flood barrier, but with a variety of methodologies around the site to guard against a monolithic engineered experience. Sea level rise protection, as it's been discussed this morning, is not limited to the bayfront shore itself. The challenge and criticality of protective measures extends to a network of creeks and channels regionally. On our site, we propose transforming Easton Creek, shown here, into an enhanced natural channel, connecting Old Bay Shore Highway to the bay, drawing visitors and residents towards the water. Earthen berms here follow the same strategy of integrated resilience. They are at once engineered protection and also natively planted inviting pathways. Bayshore Crossing aims to replace parking lots with green spaces and public plazas to revitalize the bayfront as a destination for city residents and visitors alike. This panel is about planning strategies and funding, so I thought I would share openly about what enables this sort of valuable protection to happen. We aim to execute on the city's general plan of increased density for economic growth in this area. While the city approved a 3.0 FAR in this zone, we are proposing a more modest project. Nonetheless, the creation of valuable biosciences buildings enables our investment in the meaningful community benefit of sea level rise protection. Ultimately, we commend the city and one shoreline for bold forward thinking leadership and we're excited to propose a project that incorporates over $20 million of shoreline infrastructure designed at the 17 foot crest elevation for 100 year resilience that will protect inland areas within the floodplain. This map shows the area, the, the significance of the protection our project will provide. I'm pleased to be here today with Len, whose project will provide the protection north and south of our site. Our collaborative efforts are crucial to executing on long-term resilience for the whole community. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> that was, I was so enthralled by the project. So uh, thank you so much. Um, it, lots to dig into there. I have questions that are percolating in my head. I hope others um, will share some questions. I've noted uh, the questions that have been coming in um, 
through the chat and through the Q&A. So um, appreciate that, Virginia. Uh, and um, now we'll move on to um, uh, Amy Worth, who is chair of the Bay Area Regional Collaborative, but also um, you know, a, a leader in uh, a, a city leader and a um, MTC commissioner, uh, all sorts. Of, she's just been doing a lot of important work across the Bay Area for um, a number of years. And I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. You're going to take us more to the, the regional scale at this point, which um, will be useful. And then we'll dig into some questions after Amy speaks. So you're up, Chairworth. All right. Thank you, Allison. Well, Thank you so much. It's such a joy to be here. Um, and I want to just want to say in my role as uh, on the on the Bay Area Collaborative, one of the most, I think one of the most significant things that I did with my colleagues was to hire Allison Brooks to help us in the whole effort of coordinating around this Bay Area. And you know, I was reflecting, preparing for today, reflecting on my own um, experience coming here to college in 1971. I know that sounds like I was there with Moses, you know, and he was parting the Red Sea. But um, you know that that sense of the bay, have how magnificent the bay is, and I am you know really forever grateful to you know Sylvia McLaughlin and Esther Gellick and Kay Kerr who really were among the first people to look across the bay and say stop time out we have to protect this magnificent treasure of the bay and you know one of the one of the challenges in talking about in for the Bay Area is that if you look at the other metro areas around the world, whether it's London, Tokyo, Delhi, Mexico City, we, we share this unique joy of being uh, of, a, of a region, not, by, not with one government that controls everything, but 101 cities, nine counties, you know, seven regional state agencies, that doesn't include other issues, federal and state, that are actively engaged and have independent authority to make decisions that affect the Bay, that affect the region. And that's why we're kind of like this huge relay team that our ability to coordinate in our planning is so vitally important. I mean, it's much harder to, co to coordinate all these entities than being one monolithic mega region government with full, full, um, you know, full authority to make all the decisions. We do it collaboratively. And I'm just, just hearing the panelists and speakers today, I think that this is one of the things that builds the richness of the Bay Area in terms of our decision-making process, because we do get the best and the brightest, whether they're engineers or land planners, architects, you know, just seeing Virginia's drawings of the San Mateo project. And I know building the Bay Trail is one of our great goals of completing it. I, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could see every a project like that around our entire bay, you know, where you combine jobs and housing and recreation and all at the same time protecting this bay in a beautiful organic way as opposed to sound walls. And we all watched what happened that morning in New Orleans and want to do how can we how can we protect this? So you know, it's interesting, just going back a little bit, I mean, the Bay Area had one of the first regional councils of government in the country that was ABAG in 1961. And over time, we have the Air District, we have our uh, BCDC, uh, we have the, um, you know, MTC and ABAG now working so closely together. But one of the priorities of Congressman DeSalny at the time, he was in state government, and Senator Torlakson, looking at how can we move to the next step for regional planning? How do we bring together all the various um, regional agencies that are doing such good work so we can have best practices and really coordinate it? And that resulted in what was called originally the Joint Policy Committee. And as we talked about where we needed to go, what was the highest priority for this group? We really settled on Bay rise and climate change. And as a, and now, of course, we've broadened it to sort of the multiple threat list. Counties that are that are facing both sea level rise on their coasts and wildfire risks up in the hills. These are these are issues that are so compelling to our to our citizens and residents and so important that we really work collectively, you know, to 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 address these. So out of that was born the Bay Area Collaborative. And we've the Bay Area Collaborative of the of the you know the 
regional agencies of BCDC, the Air District, MTC, and ABAG, but also incorporating the Coastal Conservancy, the Barry Water Quality Control Board, um, Caltrans, and uh, you know the broader entities that are that are inv involved in planning and implementing policies and goals for for our region. Um, the other thing that's really important to recognize included are all the people that are on the, in this these panels today that, that have spoken you know, Bay Ren and the various collaborative entities, uh, the, you know, groups, nonprofits, the Estuary Institute, entities that are really working together on these priority issues. And so as we, as we look to, as we look to BARC, you know, we, the big challenge we have in the Bay Area is to, we've got a, a lot of great organizations do, are doing great work, but one is breaking down the silos. I know other speakers have said this before, but it is more important than ever. You know, when we look at the COVID right now, what has the COVID taught us? I think two things in government. One, well, there are really sort of three things. Let me focus first. And we're going to hear from um, Larry later on, on the equity priorities. And I think his remarks will speak eloquently to the efforts that all of us are doing in terms of the importance of equity. Uh, I think that the, you know, the, the speak, the talk about, you know, East Oakland versus Facebook and who's putting in how much money is really a compelling argument and, and recognizing that the equity considerations for our, our neighborhoods that are impacted by this in communities is so imperative and that we're, you know, we continue to work together to lift up all the communities and improve the lives, especially those families and individuals who are, are you know, are, are at risk that don't have housing, that are living in neighborhoods where we need to implement you know, incredible environmental protections and continue that really important work. So the, the, the re local regional agencies kind of have these plans that, that, are in, that are foundational in terms of how do we guide the resources. One is ABAG and MTC's Plan Bay Area 2050. Uh, the second, the Air, Air District's uh, Clean Air Plan, and BCDC, its Bay Adapt Plan, which all talk about coordinating resources, coordinating efforts to, to achieve goals, significant goals in terms of the quality of life in the barrier, economic vitality, the opportunities for our, our um, residents, and also the the protection of our environment, which is really the focus. And, you know, the Bay Planning Coalition and all the work you've done over the years, you know, it's so important because the, the Bay is in many ways, the jewel of the crown of the Bay Area. And it's really one that we, we have to work so hard. And I, I think we, and the second piece is this urgency. You know, it, we've learned we do not have the time. We have to work. Um, collectively, and we have to work in a very deliberative, urgent way to achieve these goals. To and so we can turn turn over the Bay Area to our children, our grandchildren that is sustainable, that that has economic vitality, but also has incredible environmental um, uh, protection. And one of the one of the big challenges is the competition for funding. And so I think what we have done at the Bay Area Collaborative, Bay Area, Bay Area Regional Collaborative, is we have have are, have put it together a draft um, plan, and it's a, a draft plan to help coordinate the work of the of the regional agencies. And this is all being supported by the regional agencies, so it's not creating a new entity. It's saying, okay, how can we take the work that we're doing right now and bring it bring it more closely aligned in these priority areas. And so this, this the, the BARC plan is to, um, we, let me just share sort of three main goals. One is to develop a multi-hazard climate adaptation plan to support state and federal funding guidelines. So when projects go out to fund, we will have this teed up so that we'll be eligible for those funds. The second thing, and we've talked a lot about local government being critical in implementation. If you didn't, you know, the project that we saw in Burlingame, city of Burlingame has to do that. And they need the cities like Burlingame need the technical assistance, the ability to put in place those kinds of those kinds of plans. Third thing is zero emission transit, a zero emission transit fleet for the Bay Area. And with that, I just really want this plan doesn't want to touch about it, but how important 
housing is in all of this, have providing affordable housing for our residents. And, and finally is putting in place low carbon in, uh, resources in neighborhoods to build, to increase the equity, to increase equity and equity meaning fairness, equity meaning the fair allocation of resources to enhance neighborhoods that, that, that it's, it's our, such of our strong obligation to do this in terms of neighborhoods and lifting up uh, individuals and families and children to be able to have the kind of qu quality of life that we expect for everyone in the in the Bay Area. So, so this is the goal of this of this program. It's it's an ambition project, ambitious project. But what it really does is it really is focused on how do we break down the silos, because you know Congressman Garamendi talked earlier about the the funding that's going to be coming through, but he, he also alluded to the competition in Congress, the competition for dollars. And we do have, in a way, we have an advantage in that people know about the Bay Area. They know our, you know, we have the opportunity with the Bay and sea level rise and environmental uh, priorities to really be, to really demonstrate how a region can come together. On the other hand, we've got tremendous competition from places like Southern California and all of the other metro areas in, in the country to, for these funds. And it, what is really imperative in this, in this dialogue and this debate and moving forward is we do this regional coordination. We do come together with these, this, this, this plan so that when we go to compete for these dollars, whether they're state level or federal level, we are in place to be successful. Because I, I love the blazing saddles. Uh, illustration and we we uh, we typically will fight among each other rather than say okay we're going to set these priorities there's enough there's enough resources to go around we just have to do it in a way that we can be strategic in terms of reaching out to again the the, the agencies that are going to be providing the funding you know just to just to conclude in terms of the success i think when you look at the success of measure aa it is really an illustration of the fact that the voters in the Bay Area care deeply about the Bay. They care deeply about its, its environmental integrity, its uh, beauty, its economic value, and the importance of preserving it in a way that will be sustainable. And the fact that we were able to get a two thirds vote across the region is really significant. And I think it points out to the fact that if we make the case collectively and we put together a sustainable plan that's based on the science, and we are so lucky to have so many fantastic scientists and universities and engineers in our region that are going to help do this, and we bring it, either bring, bring it to the voters in the future, we bring it to Congress, we bring it to the state legislature, and we have a lot of support from our congressional delegation and our state delegation, you know, the Bay Area Caucus has been incredible in terms of making sure that we are able to have the resources. I think we can be successful, but we need to break down the silos, act with urgency. And as we look at the regional, uh, our regional agencies, I think there's a shared commitment that the outcome is so important and that we are at a time in our lives when we do need to, to move deliberately and, and, and move quickly and be, you know, again, working together, you know, we all bring unique perspectives to this, um, this discussion. And when I, when I hear the comment, you know, the speeches from early, this whole session, I'm really inspired by the work that everybody is doing and the collective commitment that we have to the Bay in our region. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today and to, and I look forward to participating in the, in the uh, discussion afterwards. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, that was a, a optimistic way to end um, and, a, and a call for all of us to um, work together, continue to work together. I, I think we have a few, um, we have some time for questions um, and I'm gonna try to weave it. My first kind of question is weaving together uh, some of those that we've gotten in the chat and, and ideas that have come up for me. Um, you know, I'll start with this question of how, where do we find resources for funding local projects to pr protect against sea level rise? I want to just so let's 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 put that out there. And then, but then we've also um, 
uh, you know, as Virginia was talking about her project and Lynn really, um, you know, laying out how you define projects, how you're beginning to think about how to define resilience projects. And then another question, I know this is uh, complicated, but um, to what extent do we need levees and other uh, protections along the whole shoreline? So there's all these pieces around how do we how do we even know what a project should be along the shoreline and how do we define the geography? And then what's the role in this? In this case, it's the county and one shoreline really thinking about how that project fits into a larger kind of shoreline condition. So, you know, I heard from Virginia that Len is uh, focused on protecting the north and south sides of her project. But also how are we thinking as a region collectively about, and this Roger, you may have some ideas here as well, how we're beginning to identify um, kind of the, the needs along the entire shoreline. And this also speaks to the regional role and how we're kind of collecting this and developing a way to kind of collect this information, understand what needs to happen where. So that was, I don't know if anybody wants to jump in, but Len, you know, maybe you could start us with thinking about how you're approaching this, along, thinking about your entire shoreline in San Mateo County and you have the coast and the bay shoreline, how you're starting to approach this as a county and any thoughts you, you have about how we would even take this on at a regional, at a regional scale. Well, I guess I would, I would say briefly, I, you know, we think about what it looks like now, what projects are out there already in the planning, design, or construction in the case of Foster City phase, and and how do we uh, acknowledge what the shoreline looks like, um, but it, in the, and create a context of that for what we want it to look like in the future. And so that wraps in some of the natural infrastructure um, that Roger and Virginia talked about, and and, and War, Warner. Um, so it. I guess, you know, the, the way I think about it is we have 11 cities in our county on the Bay shoreline. None of them uh, acting alone can, can address the issue, not only beyond their borders, but even within their borders. They can't address the issue for themselves. So it's about knitting together what the needs are of the cities, looking at what the shoreline looks like today, imagining what it could look like tomorrow, um, and, and we're looking at some, some pretty, uh, pretty novel ideas for all the shoreline, um, including pushing the envelope on what regulators had previously said is off limits, because that's what it's going to take for this transformative problem, um, is, is to you know, look at what, what should the bay look like in the future. Um, so we're, we're trying to do that. Anybody else want to jump in? Which is just one thing I would add is, um, you know, we've talked about the importance of collaboration. I think there's an, a real element too of um, government trust. Like for us, we're investing a ton in, you know, just sort of our little piece. And that piece is actually not going to do anyone any good unless there's protection south and north of that. And so I think, you know, our ability to make that investment is because we trust that others responsible for the more regional strategy are going to pull through. Right. And so I think that element of, um, you know, who's first and also having a, a long term view and a regional approach is is really crucial. So otherwise, it, it just doesn't work. Is there any just to follow up on that? Is there any kind of any what's missing that would provide further guidance for someone like you or someone, um, you know, you have the county, but is there what what, what is there anything we need to really help create more of that enabling environment um, that we don't have in place. Roger, I mean, go ahead. You could, yeah, oh, sorry. Well, just to, to respond to that quickly is that the reason we're investing in it is because we heard it was a clear priority of the city. And I think what's not represented at, you know, in this virtual room is other potential priorities, right? That maybe aren't getting investment because this is getting investment. So when we hear it's a priority to the city, a priority to the region, we'll step up. Um, I hope other people are able to step up with things like grade separation, for example, like other regional issues that, um, you know, we, we can't invest in all of them. You know, I think, Elsa, I'll just jump into, I think Virginia's comments really point to the fact that all these entities are interrelated. So the beauty about just using that example of the project is you have a combination of 
you know, environmental protection, building, you know, jo job centers, increasing density for housing, recreation. So in everything we do, and we, we need to provide the, the tools and the resources for cities. You know, I come from a small city like Burlingham. I know the love resources are limited. The vision is there. In many ways, we are so lucky in our region. We've got planners and that have this vision of what we can do. But you, you have to be able to kind of put it all in a package. It's kind of like Highway 37. It's not just a, a, cor a transportation corridor. It's going to be a transit corridor. It's going to be a workforce corridor. And it's going to be an environmental project to protect the bay. But that's the kind of thinking we have to do. And we've got to give cover and support to projects like this that really are making a difference and then expand that, you know, across the, across the, um, you know, the bay. Go ahead, I just want to real quickly, then, you know, if we're going to decide that the Bay Egg circa 2022 is where we're going to draw the line, then that's that sets us down a path of of, you know, a, a look and a system of sort of levees and, and you have to be gates. As I pointed out, there's a lot of flooding of people that is not. So redevelopment is actually the best of the world because it's a kind of a blank slate. So then you can do things that you can't do otherwise. You know, does anyone I mean, I almost feel like we're just like high tech plumbers in a way. So as anybody DIY knows, it's a lot easier to start with a clean slate than it is to try to retrofit and fit things into a existing condition. So, you know, that I mean, it's great to highlight a redevelopment project, but that's where the, the money's flowing and the and the opportunities to to retreat and to do things are are, di are um, the, at the, really the only time that really allows. But there's a hell of a lot of places where people live where that doesn't, that's not really, doable so sets up a whole other sets of conditions uh, are we going to build our levees into the bay and have the bathtub effects these are things uh, i often feel we have parallel conversations in the bay but we don't you know address head-on the conflicts between them and because you know putting levees into the bay is, is a is a real decision uh that has impacts and it's not just a levee it's a maintenance road it's a whole system of pumps so i just want to you know say that you know the best possible case is a clear redevelopment option, maybe get density and such. That's great. I don't, maybe that'll happen everywhere. I, I don't know the details on that, but so. Well, let me follow up on that. Because I mean, what you're describing is like right now we kind of have a project by project mm -hmm. approach to things. And, and we have great projects that are, you know, doing all these great things, which we heard from Virginia, but they fit into this puzzle, this puzzle of the shoreline. So mm -hmm. what you just described, these hard decisions, how we're going to make, so, uh, you know, I, uh, I got the question of times, the clock is ticking, how can we spend any more time on planning, we need to do stuff, how are we going to make these hard decisions, and who needs to be making these hard decisions, who's, who's in charge, who's in charge? Well, certainly not me. <laughs> if I can answer that, I would be a, I wouldn't be a mid-level engineer at a small flood agency. Um, but yeah, you've hit it on the head. I mean, it, it's a, there's a, I mean, I personally think a lot of this may unfold just post disaster, you know, mm -hmm. in a lot of areas, and then that's actually in some ways the worst time because then the politics shifts on its head and it's all about just rock and and engineering right away. Um, so it's like the wrong times, but I, that's the way I think historically, like Highway 37 is flooded. That's in our area. And what we did, we went out there in a weekend and hired a lot of contractors and spent half a million dollars in a weekend dumping rock to plug, plug the breaches. And so if we had post disaster planning, maybe that would help. There's all these ideas of pathways for adaptation, but the triggers are never clear. Mm -hmm. I have an idea for triggers based on all the tools of dam safety, because I think we're building dams, but other people have other ideas um that maybe are better and but we don't ever really just you know discuss in, in detail uh, what would what would be a trigger um and then there's just the cost to maintain a levy and pump system so so who decides that that's the obviously the billion dollar well amy Hutzel has said you are the one that probably should <laughs> Well, now I want to raise from that. Yeah, we're putting you in charge of the, if you're cool with that. Um, you no, know, this no. question came up about retreat, uh, as you, and you mentioned it a little bit, but retreat as a key component of resilience. So how to, and then, you know, and also Lynn, you said earlier, um, this, this idea of just embracing the water rather than trying to kind of control water, but kind of recognizing it as part of our, of our, um, of our communities and finding ways to kind of allow it to to enter into our communities differently. So any any um, any thoughts on that? I mean, we touched on it a little bit. But. Well, well, I yeah, I would say 
Um, the element of our project <clears throat> in the Burlingame ordinance that fits into that on the shoreline is the requirement of a of a buffer zone with development and and we in the city are going to look very closely at any encroachments within 100 feet, which is also not coincidentally the, the BCDC shoreline ban. Um, and so I think we're going to take a harder line than BCDC on, on encroachments on that. And, and the purpose of that is to create room for the bay and room for natural habitat along the bay and, and recreational aspects. Um, to to bring public access to the bay and then uh, on our creeks you know we're also working with developers along the creeks and and we're saying um fortunately we have the land rights to be able to say to them we you can't do this project unless uh you take out concrete and you put in uh natural uh you know natural banks and it helps the development of course because most of those developments are housing and and they'd rather have it's more attractive for, to sell their house their you know condos or whatever if if their people are looking at a natural system than a concrete line channel so it, we think it's a win win and and so far kind of we've been pretty successful at at pushing that along but you know i, I to get back to the previous question i just want to say um in terms of who decides at the end of the day the cities decide on their land use and that's super important um the best that we and, and I, I also think that countywide is kind of the sweet spot for for aligning this connection and you know if it was just the city of Burlingame that was doing its own thing with Divco and, and through a zoning ordinance um, that would be helpful but not successful and it really takes alignment with Millbrae on the north and with the city of San Mateo on the south um, in order for it to be successful and and so I think that the countywide is is kind of a good i'm not familiar with the geography of all nine counties that touch the bay but in our county countywide is is kind of a good um uh, context for providing that alignment um to be sure we need to work with santa clara county and san francisco county uh, next next door to us um but uh, i think that's kind of where where the the planning and the funding uh, should be directed so that uh we can focus on the project implementation locally one so, thing that no go ahead Virginia. well i was just gonna say i would applaud you know the city of burlingame and i think really in conjunction with you know lens collaboration with them in that hundred foot setback what enables that um and i think one of the things that enables that from our perspective and, and still us to execute on a project is uh no height restriction and increased density and so it's not a it's not a non-controversial thing to say, but by able by going high, we're able to come back from the bay somewhat, and by going dense, we're able to build really expensive infrastructure. And I think the city of Burlingame recognized that. I think that's you know explicitly those two items are in their zoning code, and I think they were able to respond to Len's request for more relief from the bay. And it's not a strict setback; it's it's evaluated case by case, and and there's some flexibility there, but. I think um, it's really the density that allows that to happen and allows development and the protection still to, to be executed on. Well, what you're describing right now though, is that it, not though, but is a high capacity county, a county that has stepped in and a high capacity developer who's and a city who are kind of working together in the, in the way that we need to see people working together on the ground and play in our, on the shoreline in places mm -hmm. that doesn't exist. I mean, so this is, I'm, I'm alluding to the the role of regional agencies and the role mm -hmm. of guidance. And maybe we can start to move into that doesn't exist everywhere around the yeah. Bay. It's a model that we want to lift up and start to bring to scale um, to other places around the Bay. I don't know, Amy, if you have any, any you, thoughts. You read my that. mind. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's such a good point is that we have different, first of all, I think the county cities coming together at the county, that county grouping is, is a great sweet spot from in terms of implementation and, and collaboration. And in a lot of the work we do is to reinforce that. Um, but I do believe that there's a huge diversity in terms of economic capacity, in terms of development capacity uh, around the Bay area and around the Bay. And so it's really important that the resources we have are, are allocated 
equitably in order to achieve those goals throughout the Bay. And I'm thinking, for example, the, the, the Richmond project with the Park District and the, you know, and the, the work that's just been recently dedicated. You know, it's, 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 it's fantastic work. Now, though a lot of the areas don't have the capacity to have large scale development pay for it. It just doesn't exist. And so what you have to do is look at state and regional and federal funding that will enable us to achieve these projects because they have to happen um, uh, you know, throughout the, all around the Bay. So, so that's, the, that's the key thing. And I think getting, giving cities the planning tools to say, okay, this is how you can work to protect your shoreline and not in a way that creates dams and walls, but does it in, in a real, in a wonderful, sustainable way. And so um, I think that is one of the challenges that the Bay Area has in terms of ensuring this geographic um, equity of, of resources, because as you've all alluded to, it, it's a continuous environment. You can't just do one section. You've got to do, do the whole thing. And we can't have work that's being done at other one area, you know, impact. It's all going to impact kind of like just the Burlingame example. You got to have work on both sides too. And I will extend that and say across the Bay. Thank you. Any other comments on, on that? Len, you look like, no, okay. I have, um, otherwise we're gonna get into CEQA reform because that's our next question. So if you have any, you know, the, uh, the inevitable question around CEQA, but we did get a question of, is CEQA reform as seen in stadiums and housing needed to allow for more responsive action to address sea level rise and shoreline resiliency? Seems like that's a question for Roger. Well, all of us, but uh, yes, I mean, CEQA is a great way to stop projects in some ways. Um, and in CEQA in a, in, a, in a changing baseline is really different. So the, the, the status quo is changing. Um, and so it makes it very difficult. And I think housing has kind of shown that when government decides they want to do something, they, they can streamline it to make it happen. So you change the rules a little bit so that you can't object. And housing now, whether it's a great idea to put a lot more people in the sea level rise zone. That's another question. But when they want to achieve a goal, they uh, you know change the rules uh, somewhat to allow for that. So that would likely be, and that really gets to the governance question you were sort of alluding to. Um, you know, and, and we have a lot of uh, contradictions in the way we're doing things. So you know, back in the fifties or sixties, you know, government when they wanted to put a freeway through right through the city or Greenwich Village, they rammed it right through or tried to. Um, and now we're the pendulum swung kind of to where it's really local control is over everything. But that also sets up uh, issues because you know no one will ever voluntarily retreat. They want to be protected. So it, it's, it sets up a lot of interesting dynamics way above my uh, you know intellectual ability and understanding of society. But, um, uh, but I think that to, to not see these sort of opposing forces in play, I think there, we need local implementation. We do need a regional agency. I think maybe that's something we could take from the Dutch. I'm not so crazy about some of their engineering. It's very hard engineering, but their governance structure is, is very um, mission driven. So it isn't a question of whether we're gonna protect, I mean, they have a country that's below sea level, so they have no choice, but it's sort of like how we're gonna get there. Um, and so I don't know, I, these are really like non-engineering questions, um, but they kind of go to a higher level of, of difficulty um, and then sequels all to my mind is sort of part of that, um, that whole puzzle. Yeah, but I think what you're alluding, it's helpful to have engineers part of the conversation earlier rather than trying to solve issues that are created before it's handed over to you to try to solve. Yeah, and I would say if anything, to, to, to stay away from sort of magical thinking about things or, you know, to really be very grounded in the truth of what it takes to build a levy system that really is adapt. So, you know, I can be nice to say we can do it without that, maybe in some places, if we're going to retreat to higher ground, sure. Or we're going to be fighting the forces of water, which are very, very tough. So to have a humbleness in our engineering ability to do that up to a certain point is also a smart and then have the resources to do it. So they can do New Orleans because the federal government's piping in money um, um, to do that. But do we, are we going to have those sort of resources? And really not for the engineers to decide what the vision is, more to like, Sort of ground that in, in the truth of what it would take. Yeah, great. Any other thoughts on that? 
I would put permitting above CEQA as, as an important area for reform. I mean, they're related, of course, um, but it's, it's, CEQA doesn't, in my experience, CEQA is much less likely to hang up um, a forward progress on climate than, than the permitting process, which is uh, even more antiquated than CEQA in my mind. All right, well, we're, uh, we're needing to end at 11.30, uh, 35. We have four more minutes. I'm, this was more of a comment rather than a question, but I'll read it, I'll read some of it, and then we can maybe have a discussion. It's, it's kind of just building off of, of you know, our conversation, um, but nature will always come out on top uh, and this, you know, are we going to, and I think to what Roger's point earlier, are we just going to, you know, and, and I think all of us share this concern, are we just going to wait until disaster strikes and then figure out what we're going to do? And I um, think what we're all together trying to figure out is how can we set up this, this system where everyone's getting the resources they need to do what needs to happen and everyone's kind of like operating from the same playbook, if you will. Um, so you know, band-aids will, will work only so long. Some major societal decisions are necessary. The city by city approach won't be successful without full cooperation among all municipal agencies. We know how easy that, that is in the Bay Area. Um, so, and then don't forget about groundwater regardless of the above ground engineering. So we know that's a, that's a concern that's emerging as well. So any, um, you know, we have a few minutes here. Any concluding thoughts? Um, any any calls to action that you think, from your vantage point, because you all sit in really unique kind of vantage points, what you think is an important you know step in response to that uh, that comment? <laughs> well, I, I'll jump in, Alice. You know, I'm, I love I love the fact that we're able to have these conferences on Zoom because I'm I'm up here in Sacramento. I'm looking out my window and I can see the Capitol. I, I really think that the advocacy that the Bay Area is engaged in, both at the state and the federal level, is really important. Because as you've heard from the the panelists today, you know, people have a real clear. Even though it's sometimes it can feel muddled, I think that the professionals that are engaged in the land use planning, the environmental initiatives, the you know all the work we've heard about, know what we need to do. They they know what we need the funding to get. They know about the coordination of the cities, and I think that's why we have to coordinate and and pull together our advocacy efforts to be able to be effective to get the funding to do the work that we know needs to happen. And, you know, it is difficult to retrofit an existing system, which much of what we're having to do is. It's very expensive. It's hard. But again, I think we have the expertise here in the Bay Area. And we just, you know, I think the opportunity is to coordinate that message and to really go with the fine approach of a laser so we can, can in fact, get the resources that our communities and agencies need, uh, you know, to achieve um, you know, these, these important goals that we've outlined uh, today and the, you know, and the urgency of it, time. We don't have the time to wait. It's, it's really urgent and it's particularly urgent right now because there is funding available. You know, we've all had these conversations in the past during times of def deficits. We have funding in the state, we have funding at the federal government. So kind of this group, we, we have the opportunity to step up and say, these are priorities. We need your help doing, doing this. I have one call to action, um, kind of building on that. I think the commenter is right about, you know, the power of nature, the importance of regional coordination. Um, but the call to action I would have is for continued leadership that we don't get caught in the sort of analysis paralysis of exactly what level we should build to. At some point, we need to execute. And that requires leadership of a ton of the people that have presented today to say, this is our educated guess about what we should be doing today. Let's do it. Um, and so I want to thank those who've kind of stepped up in that in that regard. The uncertainty of changing rules and changing requirements is um, is really scary from the execution perspective. So so leaders who can step up and and take an educated guess and make a stand about what we should be building to today now, um, it's really that's really appreciated. Right. Yeah, I mean, we've seen 
we've seen, you know, all of these charts that show ranges and, and risk, risk tolerances and all of that. It's very, and, and then you mul you kind of in, layer upon that the idea that there's 100 or 101 cities that, you know, the idea of coordination, it, you, you, we, as Virginia said, the important thing is to not get frozen and say 2030, 2050, 2100, take an aggressive number and get started on work. And once you get started, things fall into place. I mean, that's certainly been our experience at San Mateo County is we could have spent three years analyzing like what's the perfect amount of sea level rise protection, or we could have just picked a high number and gotten going. And I, I feel very confident that we made the right decision to get going. And I'm just gonna quickly, I'm, I'm gonna beat Mark out for the most you down. To, you have to close this out, right? Okay, uh, just that, uh, yeah, uh, let's not shy away from the difficult questions and, and, and um, how we move forward. Awesome. That, that was great. You all, you all did such an excellent job. Good job. Um, this is exciting. So uh, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank the panel. Um, and uh, we'll hand it over to the next panel. Thanks. Thank Dave you, Martin. Allison. Uh, thank you, Virginia, Roger, Amy, and Len. And very huge thank you, Allison. That was a great panel. Um, I, we can't recap everything. There was so much information in that. But one thing that I want to pull from is Virginia mentioned trust and collaboration with the regulators. Um, and that is one of my favorite things about being a member of Bay Planning Coalition. We don't just get together and complain about issues in the Bay Area. We actually take measured steps towards progress. And one of the most critical pathways to progress is collaborating with the agencies that have jurisdiction in the Bay Area. So that leads to our next speaker. Uh, I'm so pleased to welcome Jessica Fain. She is the Director of Planning at the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, BCDC for short, and she also directs Bay Adapt, which is a regional strategy to adapt better, faster, and more equitably to a rising Bay. Uh, as many of you know, environmental justice and social equity are mandated as part of the CEQA process. So Jessica, we thank you very much for taking your time today to speak to us on the topic of social equity and how that folds into project planning from a BCDC perspective. So please begin when you're ready. Thank you and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen and get started. So thank you so much for having me. My name is, as, as mentioned, my name is Jessica Fain. I'm the um, planning director at BCDC. Uh, we're a regional foc reg regionally focused state agency uh, with regulatory and planning authority focused on protecting and enhancing San Francisco Bay. Uh, you may be asking yourself, why are we even talking about social equity on a summit on climate resilience and funding? Is this just another one of those buzzwords? And why in the world is this woman, a white regional planner from BCDC here to talk about this? Um, so just to clear the air, um, I do not consider myself an expert on social equity or environmental justice. I do not come from, represent, or have personal lived experience dealing with the struggles related to living with the impacts of environmental contamination or the implicit or explicit racism that people of color face in America today. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I feel a little bit uncomfortable being the expert speaker on this topic. So um, I just wanted to name that issue and I hope that in the future, uh, the Bay Planning Coalition Summit can do, a, um, do more to bring in a more diverse set of speakers. Uh, but uh, over the last few years, working on how we plan for the future of our Bay Shoreline, I've learned a lot. And so with a lot of humility, I hope to share some of those learnings with you today. Uh, so as we've talked about a lot today, climate change is already happening and we need to get ready. So where do we start? Um, the Bay Area is the most culturally and geographically diverse region in the United States with people of color comprising 59% of our population. Our racial and ethnic diversity is what makes the Bay Area such a great place to live. And our Bay itself defines so much of our economy, infrastructure, environment, and lives. Our diversity of people and habitats also supports one of the most innovative economies in the world. Within this context is both diversity and inequity. Discriminatory policies implemented at all levels of government intentionally and unintentionally caused generations of communities of color to face persistent poverty, poor public health, inadequate public services, 
disproportionate exposure to polluted air, water, and soil, and underrepresentation in policymaking. BCDC recognizes this and its role in these processes. The risks from sea level rise and the resources necessary to address those risks are unequally distributed to across the Bay Area, disproportionately in, impacting many of these communities. So from Alviso to East Palo Alto in the South Bay, Bayview, Oakland and Richmond in the Central Bay, uh, the San Rafael Canal District, Martinez in the North, this map uh, shows some of the hot spots of communities who may have limited ability to prepare for or recover from a disaster like flooding from sea level rise. We also know that the health of Bay ecosystems is not just important to the planet. It's also inextricably linked to improving communities' quality of life and health. We continue to learn from how, for how nature protects people from natural disasters and improves public health. But as water levels rise, coastal habitats risk being drowned, recreation spaces lost, and underground legacy contaminants will be mobilized. Both nature and people will suffer. So for BCDC, this realization has prompted us to do some soul searching. How can we as a planning and regulatory agency who operate way up here at a regional level and give permits near the end of a project development process make a difference? What is our role in making sure that there is fair treatment and meaningful involvement of people of all races, cultures, incomes, and national origins with respect to the creating and um, implementation of environmental laws? The first step was to amend our policies in the San Francisco Bay Plan. So in 2019, the commission voted to add new policies to the Bay Plan to directly address environmental justice and social equity for the first time. It's premised on the notion that robust community involvement that happens early will result in projects that meet the many needs facing our communities and that those projects will also have a better chance of actually getting built. Uh, so there's four main policies that are in our new environmental justice section. Uh, the commission has committed to a set of guiding principles uh, to integrate environmental justice and social equity into its mission and all that we do. Recognizing that this work must start early, the policies direct BCDC to encourage and request that local governments do this in their local discretionary action approval processes in their zoning and in their um, general plans. It also requires the commission to provide leadership in collaborating transparently with other agencies on issues related to environmental justice. It requires that larger projects that come to BCDC must demonstrate that equitable, culturally relevant community outreach and engagement took place and how those issues were addressed. And finally, it requires an assessment of potential disproportionate impacts to community, vulnerable communities and how those issues are mitigated within the authorities of the commission, as well as local jurisdictions and other agencies. So policies are a great place to start, but that's really what they are, just a starting place. So since 2019, we've been thinking about what does it mean to really integrate them into our permitting process and into our climate adaptation work? Uh, the first thing we did when we after we adopted those policies was to hire an environmental justice manager for the first time. And the first thing that our environmental justice manager did was to initiate our EJ advisors program. Um, a call for six representatives working in EJ and climate justice from around the Bay went out. And um, here is the inaugural group of advisors, an incredible group of individuals who just finished their first year where they did training, education and developed their own identity as a group and how they can best be of service to advancing environmental justice at BCDC. Just last week, they spent four hours with our permitting staff learning about the regulatory process, thinking about these policies, and we're looking forward to hearing their recommendations. I'd like to thank the Resources Legacy Fund for supporting this program. Um, it's a really great example of a public-private partnership. So one of the challenges BCDC faces is that it is uh, that the bulk of project development occurs long before, you know, years, decades even, before a BCDC even receives a permit application. Process, prom, uh, permit application. Um, but there are so many places in the development process where opportunities for community engagement and public input or addressing EJ concerns can and should take place. So we started thinking, how can we best support that type of early engagement? So one of the very first things we did was to hold some early trainings with ap potential applicants, uh, folks like you. And I just wanna say thank you to the Bay Planning Coalition for partnering us on some of those trainings. 
We also developed some online tools and maps that can be used by permit applicants and community groups early in the process to begin to understand the context of the shoreline where the projects are being proposed and facilitate connections with community members. In addition to valuable information about social vulnerability and contamination vulnerability, we recently, just last week, added a new feature um, that, that launched. Uh, it includes a community-based organization directory map where you can actually draw a circle around a particular location and find names of community and EJ-focused organizations working in that location to really start that meaningful engagement process. Uh, this tool has benefited from great feedback from our EJ advisors, many of whom are represented in the directory, and I encourage you to go check it out. We are not promising a panacea. This stuff is hard and there will continue to be difficult conversations, but we think tools like this are a step in the right direction. We also believe that that same mindset for project permitting must go into planning for climate change and climate adaptation. So this starts with building community partnerships early and co-developing meaningful participation strategies. It means shutting up and listening to communities. It means shifting ownership to those communities to define for themselves their challenges, values, and solutions for how to adapt. And I'd just like to plug another new resource called the um, Adaptation Roadmap, a Practitioner's Guide, which has a whole chapter about how to really center people in the adaptation uh, planning process, as well as a lot of other great resources for how to do really robust community um, climate adaptation. And it doesn't need to be that complicated. Um, a really great organization called BARHI, the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative, put together this great resource with seven best practices, many of which came from piloting deep community engagement in East Palo Alto through a partnership with BCDC's Adapting to Rising Tides program and Nuestra Casa. Number one, and probably most importantly, is budgeting for effective community engagement. Paying participants, supporting local organizations who know and understand their communities best, and paying them at a rate that you would pay any other consultant on your project. Also think about budgeting for food and childcare and things like that. But second, there's a lot of outreach fatigue. So be creative in expanding your engagement through partnering with other agencies or groups. Um, it's important to co-design your process with the community. This means working with them from day one on how the process will go, how decisions are made. And this goes a long way to building trust. Four is making it accessible, make it relevant, talk in their language, tell a story, use video and art and music and games to really communicate um, and, and have, a, have a robust conversation. You can do this by focusing on issues and assets that are most locally meaningful and at risk, be it a hospital, a library, or a beloved ice cream shop. And then put those community supported resilience actions first. Finally, don't just collaborate to plan, but collaborate to actually bring solutions to fruition. Oh, geez. <laughs> Hopefully you can see that now. Um, so uh, just in closing, I wanted to share with you a final thought. Um, last week, I had the privilege of hearing a young man um, speak named Kevin Rowana Hernandez. He's a 19 year old, he lives in Richmond and he just started an engineering program. And he's the youth uh, representative on the Air District's Community Advisory Council. Uh, Kevin is wise beyond his years, and I learned so much for him in the short amount of time I was able to listen to him speak. Um, but one of his messages in particular stood out when a room full of adults asked him, you know, what can we be doing more to address the climate change? He, he sort of paused and went into deep thought and reflection, and then he said, you can all do more. Each and every one of you, whatever it is that you do, just do more. And so with that, um, thank you and please do more. Thank you very much, Jessica. <clears throat> that, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you addressing such a difficult and important topic with candor and um, clarity. And I, I, I must admit, I kind of got goosebumps there at the end when you told that story. So thank you. And we very much look forward to working with you and uh, um, on this topic in the future. If anybody has questions or would like to further engage, please reach out to Jessica or anyone at BCDC uh, directly. So we are headed into the final, the finale, excuse me, the final uh, section, which is the finale, the grand finale of our spring summit. This is going to be an expert led panel on funding. What else? How do we get funding? Our moderator is Dilip Trevetti 
a principal engineer and the lead for the coastal engineering practice at Moffat and Nickel. In his 30 years of local practice, Dillop has managed some very important and some very grand coastal restoration and waterfront development projects. So he does know firsthand the importance of securing that funding, not only through the very early stages, but all the way through the construction process. So Dillop, it's all yours. Well, thank you. Sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. You sound great. Well, well thank you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just say in listening since morning, I know it's just been an amazing, you know, I would say a learning experience for me. You know, I'm so focused on the technical aspects of, you know, the OPC curves and the other curves and things like that. But this has been an amazing, you know, so very well stitched together program. Uh, excellent speakers, excellent presentations, and I'm sure most of the audience would agree with the quality of the, um, you know, the presentations that have come out here. So this panel, you know, we've heard a lot about the need and the urgency, right, of responding to climate change as a region. We've heard about project scale uh, from Roger and from Virginia. We've heard about countywide scales of uh, responding from Len. Um, we also heard about, you know, the absolute need to address social equity. Um, some of Warren, um, um, I think it was Warner's uh, slides about, uh, no, sorry, Mark's slides about, you know, um, Facebook versus West Oakland. I mean, those were just mind blowing, you know, to, to see that. Well, in this panel, we're going to talk about success stories, so case studies, and also about opportunities to, um, that are out there. You know, so what are the opportunities in terms of funding availabilities that are out there to respond to climate change? Our first speaker is Amy Hutzel with the Coastal Conservancy. Um, for the folks, if you haven't heard about the Coastal Conservancy, you're going to hear a lot about them in the next few decades as they go from restoration and from bay trails to climate change and resilience. Um, also someone I've had the pleasure of working with for at least 20 years now with Amy, uh, ever since the South Bay Salt Ponds were acquired. <laughs> Uh, Brad Benson with the Port of San Francisco, you know, again, a classic of, you know, I would say a first example of a citywide initiative, which is focused and funded, you know, primarily on resiliency. Uh, Nointara, okay, with the uh, Governor's Office of Planning and Research, uh, how the how Sacramento is assisting statewide, and then from Coral Abbott uh, with the Strategic Growth Council, where she's going to talk about um, resilience from, at a community scale and what opportunities are out there. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Amy. Amy, welcome and thank you. Hey, thank you, Dilip, um, for the introduction. And thanks to everybody who has um, spoken so far. It's been um, very um, thought-provoking, um, inspirational set of speakers. Um, and obviously we're facing very challenging uh, issues. Um, and there's a, a mix of, of opinions on, on how to best address it. So thanks to Bay Planning Coalition for pulling this together. Um, uh, before diving in on the funding piece, um, uh, John Coleman had just asked um, for me to touch on some of the uh, equity work that the Coastal Conservancy and the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority um, has been undertaking. And um, Mark's uh, early slide about the Restoration Authority funding, um, that was definitely thought provoking. Um, I would say, you know, the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, the parcel tax is $12 per year per parcel. So a dollar a month um, for each parcel in the Bay Area. And there are, you know, inequities <laughs> with taxation. Um, however, you know, the, at least for the authority, it's uh, a relatively small amount. Uh, and uh, as Warner pointed out, well over 70% of voters in the Bay Area uh, supported it. I would also say the authority has been working really hard to um, uh, some of that funding towards community groups. Um, so for example, the, the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project is one of our recent grantees. So along with funding um, 
capital projects, um, larger projects around the Bay. We have a separate uh, community um, projects grant program. It's um, done on an ongoing basis. So entities can uh, reach out to us uh, consult with our staff and apply. And we, we have a number of grants um, uh, out there now for that community-based uh, work. Uh, and at the Coastal Conservancy, uh, in our strategic plan, we've set a um, numerical objective of 35% of our state funding going towards projects that benefit uh, disadvantaged communities. And over the past four years, um, we've actually exceeded that goal um, through a lot of, of effort uh, developing our, our JEDI guidelines and then really um, our staff working uh, hard to develop relationships and uh, support projects um, within, within DACs. Uh, the focus of this talk is uh, it's it's mostly a very good news story about uh, state uh, coastal conservancy funding and, and the outlook for funding. Um, so this first slide just gives a, a summary of um, how our budget looks, which is one, you know, one piece of the pie of the overall um, state climate resilience package, which is one piece of the pie of, of the overall resources package and a very small sliver of the pie for the state's overall budget. Uh, and I think we're gonna find out more today. The May revise is, is coming out today. And I know this afternoon there's gonna be um, uh, various presentations on what's included in the May revise. So uh, there's a chance, you know, uh, overall numbers are going to go up for climate resilience. Uh, we'll, we'll see what, what happens uh, later today. Uh, as, um, as of right now, the Conservancy, uh, we have funding for Explore the Coast. We have some remaining Prop 68 funding. We have some wildfire um, prevention funding in uh, the 21-22 budget. Um, but what we're really looking forward to is the 22-23 budget and then even the 23-24 budget. As part of the governor's climate resilience package um, that was put out last September, uh, it was a three-year plan for climate resilience. It included 500 million for coastal resilience coming to the Coastal Conservancy. So 350 million. Uh, knock on wood, um, should be starting as of July 1st, and then another 150 million the following year. And then there'll also be some wildfire prevention funds, um, that's in the governor's budget, and a final appropriation of our Prop 68 funding. Um, so we are looking at um, uh, significant funding for, for our work. Next slide. So coastal resilience um, term, we are looking at a very broad definition. So you can see in the box projects along the coast, including coastal wetlands and watersheds, beaches, dunes, bluffs, bays, fisheries, and other wildlife and projects that build resilience for coastal communities, public access and critical infrastructure. That was in the bill last year. And then there were some specific program areas bill as well. So we will definitely be looking back at that list um, uh, as we determine um, uh, what projects we're funding. Um, and then uh, the conservancy, we provide grants. Um, we undertake some projects on our own like Hamilton, Bomer and Keys. Primarily we do our work um, via grants, um, working with others. So grants to nonprofits, to tribes, to local agencies, local governments. Uh, next slide. So in parallel with this um, funding uh, coming to us, we are um, updating our five-year strategic plan. 
Um, we will have it done by the end of this calendar year, by the end of 2022. We're not gonna delay though, in terms of getting um, calls for grant applications and the review of projects and moving projects forward. Um, so we, we, we're not waiting until we have a final adopted strategic plan. Uh, in terms of our strategic plan, there are many, many guiding documents. Um, we are not starting from scratch, either in terms of the content or the uh, uh, stakeholder input um, for this strategic plan. We're gonna be looking at our, our JEDI guidelines, um, which we developed over two years, at our project selection criteria, which we just finished um, development of, uh, at our enabling legislation. As I said, we'll be looking at the budget language and we're gonna be looking at all of the state, not maybe not all of them, but um, a lot of the state and regional plans that are already out there. So, you know, plans like 30 by 30 and the natural and, and working lands report, the Baylands goals report that Warner talked about earlier, the Southern California wetlands recovery project uh, and many uh, uh, regional plans. Um, and those, that set of planning documents, the input we've received, they're leading us towards this um, list of project areas. Uh, and I, I won't read that aloud, but uh, you can see it is heavily focused towards um, nature-based projects and, toward, and towards serving uh, communities that um, perhaps lack capacity to address climate change. Uh, we also uh, want to implement projects that have, you know, been in development uh, for a, a long time. So, you know, looking at these, the regional planning that's gone on, the projects that have come out of that and supporting that work. Again, we're not starting from scratch with all of this. And we really heavily support regional coordination uh, and we want to see projects that are regionally supported, um, supported by tribes, supported by um, uh, low-income communities uh, and stakeholders um, and supported by um, uh, elected officials. Um, and I think that's about it on our funding picture. I just had one little last thing to add, which is about that sediment question. And while it's not the whole answer, I would really encourage um, support for beneficial use of, of dredge sediment um, by the Corps of Engineers. And we are um, fighting that you know, good fight on a on a regular basis with the core. Um, it's not going to fill that entire you know humongous shape that Warner showed, but it's um, it's an important part. Uh, and I hate to see sediment going out to the deep ocean when we should be using it for shoreline resilience. So that's my that's my little plug at the end, Philip. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm into that. You know, I would say. If we can fill, you know, maybe ten of those four hundred Salesforce towers with beneficial reuse, that would be an accomplishment, you know, for sure. Uh, next speaker, Brad, Brad Benson. Uh, please, over to you. Thank you for attending. <laughs> thank you, Tilla. Um, so I want to thank John and the Bay Planning team for putting this on. I think it's been an amazing conference. Um, just. Um, thinking about Warner's sense of urgency, um, Allison's emphasis of the need for planning, <laughs> um, and you know what Roger was saying about retreat and what we're actually building uh, along the shoreline. I just think uh, it's really sort of underscored a lot of what we're confronting in the Port of San Francisco's waterfront resilience program. Um, so. Um, I, I lead the port's resilience program. Uh, it was founded in 2018. Our you know, initial concern was really around earthquake risk. Um, 
uh, we identified through a number of design and construction projects along the shoreline, a real problem with instability of our seawall, which was constructed over a hundred years ago. Um, before a sort of a modern understanding about earthquakes and um, you know how, how they operate in weak soils. Um, I think this condition along the San Francisco shoreline is not unique to San Francisco. I think we have to think about this problem in filled areas around the Bay as we're thinking about coastal flood defenses. Um, uh, we went to the voters um, uh, with this problem and uh, proposed a $425 million general obligation bond the seawall earthquake safety bond, which also included in it, uh, um, you know, shoreline resilience uh, to sea level rise. And uh, it was a remarkable public response. We had an 83% vote in favor of the bond. Um, we've been working since then to do a very technical deep dive um, producing a multi-hazard risk assessment for the Embarcadero stretch of the shoreline from Fisherman's Wharf to Mission Creek. We've been planning and have identified 23 Embarcadero early projects, um, the total cost of which far exceeds the bonds that we have available to us. We're advancing 11 of those projects to pre-design using the bond. Just in terms of what you're seeing on the screen here, you know, we have a serious lateral you know, lateral spreading shoreline failure risk along the Embarcadero. The, the, the picture uh, on the right-hand side in the middle is after the 1906 earthquake. Um, and this is right near the Pier 27 James R. Herman International Cruise Terminal. And we do expect damage like this in uh, a major earthquake. And there's a 20% uh, possibility of a 1906 type of event in the Bay Area in the next 30 years. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. You know, as we're thinking about major investment on the shoreline, obviously we're thinking about how we adapt to, to sea level rise. Um, you know, in San Francisco, we're built right up to the edge often on these weak fill areas. Um, um, just thinking about what's in the future floodplain, we have 40 plus miles of road, um, 14,000 residents. Major elements of our, our combined sewer system are right in uh, you know, the Embarcadero and the areas around the creeks that you see here. Um, major regional infrastructure, BART passing through under the ferry building and 25 miles of muni track. Um, so thinking about those different strategies of defend, accommodate and retreat, um, you know, we think our varied shoreline is gonna require a hybrid of those strategies. And we're, we're lucky to be working, one of those communities working with the Army Corps of Engineers on a general investigation of flood risk. Um, we're aiming to produce a preferred plan uh, for coastal flood risk management by mid 2023. Um, obviously the Corps needs to find a federal interest where the avoided flood damages of that project outweigh the costs uh, and it can be difficult to meet that benefit cost test. Um, just thinking about what we'll have to do, we're looking, depending on the elevation of the shoreline today <laughs> and the sea level rise curve that we select, we're gonna have to raise the shoreline between two and 10 feet. Um, our coastal flood modeling shows that we're gonna have significantly more storm damages in the period between 2030 and 2040. So, you know, the time is sooner than many of us think um, to, to start these major interventions along the shoreline. And if you think about San Francisco, think, you know, situate yourself right near the ferry building, as an example, and think about raising that stretch of shoreline by up to 10 feet. Uh, and it's just, 
an immense infrastructure project that affects not just the shoreline, historic resources, major transportation infrastructure, wastewater infrastructure. So it really does require breaking down silos. And the way that we're attempting to do that um, is with um, by establishing a resource agency working group of the many uh, regulatory agencies around the Bay, also co-creating these strategies with the public and with our city partners. Let's go to the next slide, please. So um, just a little framing about the city's 10-year capital plan. This covers all of the city's capital needs through 2031. The bottom line number is about $38 billion. And San Francisco, which you know has a you know good property tax base, um, has to rely on federal, state, and other sources for more than half of its ten-year capital plan. Uh, general obligation bonds only cover about twenty percent of the total costs. Um, by having a transparent capital plan, we've established some voter confidence. It takes two two thirds vote to pass general obligation bonds, but we've had pretty, pretty good success since 2008 with 6 billion approved by voters and another 2 billion just in the last two years. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of detail on here and I'll just pick out a few things to talk about, but it will be in the deck uh, that is circulated to participants. Um, so our current strategies are the general obligation bond. We've got another one uh, that's a resilience bond in the general obligation bond schedule in 2026. We're really eager to see even more funding at the state level. Um, the Senate budget proposal includes $3.4 billion for sea level rise for urban waterfronts, ports, public infrastructure, and ecosystem protection. We think that's a really great proposal, and it will position California communities to take advantage of the federal infrastructure bill, particularly if it's focused on planning and pre-design efforts over the next couple of years. Um, we have used development as a tool in, in some segments of the San Francisco waterfront. We've got um, Mission Rock development and Pier 70 development, new neighborhoods that are little, literally raising the grade of the shoreline uh, to deal with up to six feet of sea level rise. In those cases, we've used tax increment financing uh, through infrastructure financing districts and special taxes, community facility districts to help fund some of those improvements. I've talked about the Army Corps study. Um, I'll just say that there's going to be an upper limit established by that benefit cost test as to how much funding we'll be eligible for. Uh, it's not likely to cover the 10 or more billion dollars we're talking about for this effort um, on its own. We did, um, you know, we're very grateful to have uh, the support of Speaker Pelosi. She helped us get some language in, in the Army Corps' governing bill, the Water Resources Development Act, to provide equitable treatment for communities in high seismic risk areas. And then I'll close by saying, we think there's a lot of work that needs to be done at the federal level to simplify the process for obtaining federal money. You know, it's one thing if you're a fairly well-to-do jurisdiction and you can afford these, these very complicated studies, um, but it is extremely complicated to apply and prove a benefit cost uh, for your project. Um, and I think that there's an equity issue in that. So we wanna see the federal government make that process simpler and make it a process that aligns across federal agencies. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Dilip. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, yeah, very insightful. You know, thanks a lot for, uh, for I would say, your leadership, really, at the port and at the city itself. Um, the next speaker, um, Nuintara. Uh, Nuintara Key, please. Uh, now, just as a FYI for all the uh, attendees, you know, the full bios of all the speakers are in the program itself, and so I'm not necessarily going through. Um, but it's a pleasure to have Nantara here 
to give Sacramento's perspective to us as a region here. So welcome. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here um, and wonderful to hear the um, previous speakers and, and presentations here today. So as was mentioned, I'm new in Tara Key. I'm deputy director for climate resilience in the governor's office of planning and research. And we run our integrated climate adaptation and resiliency program through our office. Next slide, please. To kick us off here today, I wanted to provide just a brief kind of overview of the work that we're doing through our office in the Governor's Office of Planning and Research on Resilience and Adaptation, and then frame out some of the state perspective kind of priorities on resilience and adaptation, both in terms of kind of the policy priorities, but then also how that is reflected in our funding proposals and recent budget um, decisions that have come through last year, and then also informing this year's budget proposal, which as Amy mentioned, the governor just released the May revise. So um, I'm gonna provide some of that context, policy funding, and then talk about some specific funding opportunities that are coming online through our office. So to start, for those who may not know, OPR, oh, sorry, previous slide. OPR serves uh, the governor and cabinet on long range planning and research issues. We also serve as the state's land use planning entity. In addition, we have a statutory role on climate resilience and adaptation really to serve as the hub for state policy alignment and coordination, both across state agencies, but also importantly with our partners on the ground including public agencies, local governments, regional governments, and tribes and tribal governments, but also with our nonprofit and private sector partners. There are four kind of key drivers to the work that we do in our office. First is driving a science to action agenda. And most recently, you know, we're really excited to be standing up the um, California Fifth Climate Change Assessment, um, really being able to serve communities and decision makers with the data and information they need to make informed climate adaptation and resilience investments and funding decisions. The next is really accelerating collective action. I'm going to talk about this one a little bit more when I cover the priorities that are now reflected through the updated state climate adaptation strategy. Third is driving an integrated climate agenda. One of the things we have focused on in our office and through our work is really elevating the importance of adaptation and resilience as equal part to the state's climate agenda, in addition to maintaining um, implementation of ambitious emissions reduction goals and targets. And then fourth, but definitely not least, and cutting across all the work we do in our office, is a commitment to ensuring equitable adaptation outcomes, recognizing climate is an exacerbator of existing inequities and adaptation solutions need to also be addressing uh, those underlying conditions. And I know my colleague, Coral Abbott, who will come on next, will talk about some specific programs to um, targeted at that as well. So next slide, please. So going to the kind of policy priorities that I mentioned at the top that I was gonna cover for framing here, California recently updated our climate adaptation strategy and apologies, this side is animated. So you can just tick through all the animations at once. Um, that's it, the next one, please. Great. Um, so our adaptation strategy, the state is responsible for updating it every three years. We just released in March, the most recent update. And I want to really highlight um, one of the evolutions, uh, important evolutions as we are approaching the update for this strategy, which is for the first time, really framing the strategy around six resilience priorities. I'm going to go over these in a little bit more detail in a second, but these are fill a really important gap that we at the state have been working to close over the last couple of years, which is articulating the priorities and the outcomes that we want to be working towards to build resilience. And one of the things I think especially important for this conversation here today is now that we have brought those priorities together, really looking at those to help inform and guide state investments in adaptation and resilience, um, something that we have not been able to, we have not had previously through um, previous versions of the strategy. 
Really quickly, just for context, um, the strategy pulls together nearly 150 climate adaptation actions from across all sectors and all regions of the state. It also includes, for the first time, time-bound success metrics so that we are better able to track our progress over time and increase transparency and accountability in terms of our progress of working towards and achieving those priorities that I mentioned at the top here. We also, an important component of this update is we released the strategy as an interactive website. You can see the URL here on your screen. Um, would love for people to go and take a look at the strategy. But one of the things we really wanted to do to achieve through this update was making sure that the strategy is accessible but also provides a structure for us to be able to update our progress and evolution of our work on adaptation in better time. So this, by presenting the strategy as a website, really provides us the right structure as opposed to you know, updating a very long static um, state report. So um, that's just some overview of the strategy big picture. And next slide, please. So now those priorities. Um, one of the things that was really important that we heard extensively through our public or through uh, through heard through our extensive public engagement process over the last year was the need for an articulation of our priorities and a way for the state to evaluate our progress towards building resilience. So the um, Goal here across these priorities is to present co-equal priorities, each of which drive on important outcomes. So, you know, we were looking at priorities around protecting vulnerable communities, recognizing the important role of public health, but also protecting and, you know, ensuring safety against increased climate risk. Importantly, building a climate resilient economy, accelerating nature-based solutions, making decisions on best available science, and then importantly, partnering and collaborating to leverage resources. And I'm gonna um, come back to that last point here in a second when I talk about specific funding priorities for our office. Next slide, please. So pivoting to the climate resilience package that was agreed to last September, as Amy also referenced this in her presentation, Last year's historic investment in climate included the most significant um, investment towards climate resilience in the state's history. And one of the things I really wanna highlight here, building on the kind of policy priorities that I just walked through, is our very intentional focus on making sure the state was providing resources to the foundational planning, capacity building, and other activities that are critical to see the right type of infrastructure as well as implementation projects on the ground. We absolutely recognize that you know, building a pipeline of resilience projects requires coordination, collaboration, planning, and capacity building. And really that was the kind of theory and approach that we took to the community resilience section of last year's climate budget. This is also mirrored in this year's, uh, the governor's um, budget proposal for this year as well. So in terms of the specific funding here that came through, I'm gonna touch mostly on the funding that came over to our office, the Office of Planning and Research. Um, and then um, happy to answer additional questions when we turn to discussion later on in this panel. But one of the things that we wanted to, um, and are really excited about, wanted to highlight here is the funding we have coming online this year for our climate adaptation planning grants. So we will have 25 million over allocated over three years to support that foundational planning and assessment work that is so critical to developing the right pipeline of resilience projects and priorities within communities. We also had one-time funding to support scaling our climate services team and work that we do through our office, which is really making sure we're translating science to action and providing communities with decision support tools to help do that foundational planning and analysis work. And then another exciting opportunity we have here is, and that we're standing up now, is our new Regional Climate Resilience Planning and Implementation Grant Program, which is really gonna be focused on helping regions scale regional 
climate, so we're resilience climate solutions. And we have 250 million over three years, really looking forward to kicking off robust engagement on the guideline development process here this coming year. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight at the bottom of this slide is California's fifth climate change assessment, which I mentioned earlier, but just noting that we um, received significant funding to be able to implement the fifth assessment as well. Again, providing the foundational data and climate projections and research to help inform um, actionable climate action on the ground. And I think with that, I'm going to wrap and say thank you. Looking forward to the discussion after my colleague Coral's presentation. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Quintara. Um, you know, while there is, there are lots and lots of streams of funding, um, we need to learn how to navigate through, uh, you know, all of those funding. And so with that, uh, Coral, who is with the Strategic Growth, Growth Council, will talk about um, the resilience, uh, community resilience. Welcome, Coral. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dilip, and thank you to the previous speakers and to New and Tara. I think that was a really uh, good segue into some of the conversation I'll be bringing forward today that's a little bit more detail on some of the programs SGC has available um, that are very much connected to the um, kind of climate resilience priorities outlined by New and Tara. So, my name is Coral Abbott. I am the Community Resilience Center's Program Manager at SGC. Um, and I am gonna just quickly go over SGC, who we are, the kind of work we do, and then dive into some of those funding programs like I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. So the Strategic Growth Council, or the SGC, is an interagency body that's housed within the Office of Planning and Research, as you might be able to tell from Nu and Tara and I's similar backgrounds. Um, we were established back in 2008 and tasked with coordinating the activities of state agencies on a number of policy priorities, including improving air and water quality, protecting natural resources and agricultural lands, promoting public health, increasing the availability of affordable housing, and a number of other um, policy priorities that are pretty varied, as you can see. Um, how we kind of organize this work is through our vision and mission that incorporate those broadly in thinking about the work that we do. So um, a vision of building healthy, thriving, and resilient communities for all. Our mission is to coordinate and work collaboratively with public agencies, communities, and stakeholders to achieve sustainability, equity, economic prosperity, and quality of life for all Californians. So really comprehensive, holistic um, kind of look at climate and other issues. The council's overseen by a number of council secretaries and appointees by the governor and the legislature. Um, our chair is actually um, the OPR, Office of Planning and Research Director. Um, and so our council has to vote to adopt program guidelines and awards. So by the nature of our structure, as this interagency body, our programs involve quite a lot of interagency coordination and collaboration to consider and include the needs of different stakeholders and policy areas um, across the state. Next slide, please. So in this kind of broad set of work we have across our um, investment programs, our initiatives, um, the key themes that organize us are one, fostering collaboration, so looking at the statewide and interagency collaborative partnerships um, to try and yield innovative work through bringing together these diverse perspectives. Two, advancing health and equity, understanding and addressing the systemic um, inequities that persist in California, especially among historically marginalized communities. Um, supporting communities' capacity to drive action. So actually empowering and supporting communities uh, to be the engines of change that can collaboratively envision and implement projects, programs, and policy changes to improve the lives of residents. Um, and then integrating research and data for policy innovation, so leveraging and promoting uh, data that contributes to the success of investments, programs, and initiatives for SGC, other state agencies, and our partners. And then at the center of all of this is building resilient communities, so fostering um, and providing support to communities so that they're able to recover, grow, and adapt through the challenges um, that currently are and will be brought about by climate change, public health inequities, and economic downturns. Next slide, please. 
Um, so I'm going to touch on a couple of our programs in a little bit more depth and then um, uh, cover a few others very briefly that are related to resilience. So starting out um, with the Community Resilience Program uh, Centers Program, this will provide funding for construction or retrofit of resilience centers that are community serving institutions. So that might be libraries, health clinics, community centers, schools, places of worship, really depending on the local community context and where folks are going for resources um, for shelter. And so in addition to upgrades or construction costs to ensure that the buildings are able to provide physical shelter during times of climate or other emergencies, um, we'll also be thinking in program design about considerations like backup water and energy, transportation to the resilience center, broadband access, all of those kinds of bigger considerations in those times of emergency. And then in non-emergency times, the centers will also be conducting programming and providing other community services on a regular basis with the goal of increasing community resilience um, through the development of that kind of social cohesion as something that we know is critical to building community resilience. So this might look like food and water distribution, job trainings held at the center, and classes or trainings held on disaster preparedness. Um, the funding for this program will come in July of this year, so in the upcoming uh, budget year, and we'll begin a public guidelines development process um, and anticipate that we'll release an application in early 2023 for both planning and implementation grants is what we um, think for this program. There's also funding in the budget for a second round, which will likely be available the following year. There's also proposed funding additional um, in the May revised budget. So we have currently 100 million proposed for over two years that we know is gonna come through and potentially depending on the outcomes of the current uh, May revise and this next year's budget, um, that number could increase. Next slide, please. So the Regional Climate Collaboratives or RCC grant program led by the Community Assistance for Climate Equity team is a capacity building grant program that seeks to provide support to help under-resourced communities in California to envision and plan climate change, mitigation, resilience, and adaptation projects. So unlike many of our other grant programs, this program funds activities that build specific communities in the overall region's capacity to be able to develop, plan, and implement climate-related projects. Grantees will be collaboratives of multi-sector partners that focus on building relationships of potential climate partners across the broader region, and that's really dependent on local context, who makes the most sense um, to be a part of this work. Um, then work to identify community priorities in key under-resourced communities within the region, and then from there, develop those plans, policies, and projects that address those priorities. Um, then we anticipate they'll also act as a local technical assistance provider that can help to translate grant program requirements from state, federal, or other sources, and then frame them in a local context for organizations that are trying to apply to those funds. A critical piece of this program is that it's seeking to fund collaboratives to build capacity in a way that centers under-resourced communities through developing very clear processes for community-based organizations, residents and other groups that are often not centered in this type of work to have a real meaningful and impactful role in the decision making processes and also embedding community engagement and the related costs throughout the grant term and grant activities. Um, the notice of funding availability for this program actually went out yesterday, so it's very fresh um, there's about 8 million available in this first round and pre proposals are due July 15th so i'll send. Um, in a moment, the link for that in the chat. Next slide, please. So this is moving into the suite of programs that are a little less focused on resilience, but definitely have resilience considerations embedded into them. Um, so the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program, or AHSC, funds both affordable housing and transportation to encourage dense infill development, affordability, and increased transit and active transportation options in different community contexts across the state. So the program does fund projects in urban, suburban, and rural contexts, and also has a tribal set aside. Um, 
This program also requires applicants to consider climate vulnerabilities of the specific location and region and how they plan to account for that in the program design. Um, and the number here on what the amount of funds awarded is actually out of date. So the current number is about 2.4 billion. And actually about a third of that has gone to the Bay Area in the first six rounds. Um, the program gets continual funding from the state's cap and trade auctions. So it is a predictable source of funds that communities and governments can look to um, for funding these types of projects over the next several years. Although it is a competitive process, it is a predictable one. Um, next slide, please. So the Sustainable Agricultural Lands Conservation or SALC program is the sister program of AHSC. While AHSC funds dense infill development, SALC funds projects that support agricultural conservation. So kind of the flip side of the work to prevent sprawl, which we know is a huge contributor to emissions in California specifically. Uh, this program funds both implementation grants for farmland conservation and then very flexible planning grants in this same kind of field. Uh, next slide, please. So the last program I'll cover, the Transformative Climate Communities Program, or TCC, provides funding for a suite of GHG, or greenhouse gas emission reducing projects at the neighborhood level in the most disadvantaged communities in the state, using a process where community members co-lead the development and implementation of community serving projects that are intended to have a catalytic effect on their neighborhoods to really initiate and begin the investment needed to make um, those communities meet our kind of vision for what communities in California should be looking like. Um, very critical to TCC are the transformative elements, which include that comprehensive community engagement and partnership I just mentioned, as well as displacement avoidance plans and workforce development plans to try and ensure that as these very needed investments go into communities, the residents of those communities are able to actually stay there and experience the benefits of those projects and investments. Um, TCC was recently provided funding for the fourth round of the program and has an open application out right now. Um, they're planning to fund three implementation grants of $35 million and four planning grants of $300,000. So all of these uh, programs are on our website. Um, happy to point folks more directly, but otherwise won't spam the chat with, you know, 15 links. Um, and very much happy to answer any more questions about SGC. We didn't get to cover all of the work we do, but just wanted to focus on these specifically. So uh, feel free to get in touch. And thank you so much for your time. Well, oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Coral. Um, well, that really is, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a new, uh, new sources, new new funding programs and stuff. And we really need to get the word out there to the communities in the Bay Area itself, you know, and how to access those funds. Uh, you know, there are, there are quite a few questions, um, uh, you know, that have come up. Um, I'll, I'll start with one, you know, and I think this one is probably more directed, the first one to Amy and to Brad, um, both, you know, more of a discussion type here. You know, given the early successes of Water approved measures, you know, measure AA, the general obligation bonds for the seawall resilience. Um, are you seeing that those are becoming sort of the tip of the spear as, you know, more pressure to have more water approved bonds are going to happen in the future? Um, you know, with, with a focus not just on restoration or wetlands or flood management, but greenhouse gas emissions, you know. I mean, are you seeing those? And so could you talk about maybe just the challenges that were faced with this um, and how you navigate it through is because those truly are successful case studies for both of those waterproof measures. Amy, do yeah. you wanna? Oh yeah, I can talk about measure AA. Um, and I think um, Mark North, North Cross's um, slide about that was really, you know, thought provoking uh, in terms of scaling, scaling up measure AA. Um, what I would say is it took nearly a decade uh, to put that measure on the back in the San Francisco Bay area. Um, 
we went through, you know, a, a recession. Um, we went through a lot of polling um, and basically people's willingness to support um, a measure like that is very tied to how they feel about the economy and the future of the economy. Um, so I think if you were gonna do that in the Bay Area for something, you know, larger than Measure AA, which is, you know, nature-based um, shoreline protection, uh, you'd need to have a strong coalition, um, a lot of polling, and um, an entity willing to run a, a campaign and, and raise money for it. Um, and I could talk, I could talk all day about how you getting that on the ballot and just all the the costs of it. Um, I'm really happy it passed. <laughs> yes, absolutely. No, I think there is so much material here that we probably will have a focused briefing or a workshop just on, you know, voter approved measures and how, you know, Mark has talked about, you know, more and more also we're seeing, you know, things like environmental bonds and muni bonds, you know, just, just, just all those things, you know, we'll probably have a focused one. Um, Brad, your experience more at a local scale, at a city scale? Um, you know, I think for the city, the, the, the recipe has been that sort of transparency in capital planning. Um, uh, the city's also made efforts to try and keep the tax rate the same over time by planning for the issuance of new bonds approved by voters as old bonds are paid off. And I think that bonds are not the primary solution. I mean, you saw on my slide that it's about 20% of the city's capital funding, and we really need this mix of funding sources at the federal, state, and local level. Um, so we need that combination. But it's a, it's a great tool, and I think it probably is underutilized in other Bay Area cities and counties. I think San Francisco has one of the more robust geo bond programs uh, in the area. So, okay, great. Well, fine. Thank you. Um, and then building upon that itself, and I think this is probably more directed to to you, Nuntara, and to Coral. Um, you know, what we're seeing is that the early success stories came because there was a lot of planning effort that went into it, right? And so those those planning were funded by the cities or by uh, you know, regional agencies itself. Um, what sort of guidance would you give to communities, um, you know, that are approaching you? Given you know that they've looked at your website, looked at you know the amount of uh, programs that are available. Um, you know, what specific guidance would it be? You know, well, go approach Bark and talk to Allison. Would it go to you know Amy and talk to about the conservancy? You know, I think navigating. You know, it's all out there, but you know, navigating it such that they have the best chance of success, um, you know, would be great to hear from you. You know, do you see us? And maybe on a flip side of that, what guidance would you have to BCDC and and and, and Bark and all of that? You know, how do you work with your local communities within the Bay such that we have the best chance for success with a grant application? Yeah, maybe I'll, um, I can start and then hand it to Coral. Um, so I think one of the, one of the things that I would recommend, and this ties in a little bit to the previous question and both to Amy and Brad's response on the, you know, on the previous question is as, you know, local governments, communities, regional governments, entities are really, you know, looking at what are your needs, both in terms of understanding what future climate risk means to your communities, charting out priorities, and then looking at implementation. One of the things that we have been giving um, guidance on, especially to our local partners, is really thinking about the mix of funding and financing that is needed both for implementation, but also, and I know there's a question in the Q&A around long-term maintenance, because, you know, from my perspective and kind of coming from a state perspective, state funding alone, there isn't enough 
to meet the need the, of implementation needs on the ground. So I think, you know, Brad, very much taking to heart your slide and your points around needing to understand what are the different funding and financing tools? What are, how do you align those different funding and financing tools? And then, you know, specifically when looking at state funding, how are you really leveraging the opportunity of the funding we have coming through to meet some of the needs where there aren't gonna be financing mechanisms to meet some of the, um, the needs within communities. And that's where going back to the climate resilience and the, especially the community resilience funding package and, package and the theory behind the funding we put there is really recognizing there are there is a really you know big need for state funding for community capacity building for that foundational planning work that is otherwise very hard to finance as we're thinking about the type of aligning projects and, and priorities within communities. So that would be one of my recommendations is don't wait till your plan is done to figure out how you're going to fund and finance implementation. That should be part of the first step that you know any community is doing is really thinking about how to get that funding on, um, and financing lined up. To your last point really quickly, and then I'll hand it to Coral, is um, around kind of recommendations or guidance to the regional structures and regional entities you know, I think there's such a need to help communities, local governments, um, local communities align priorities so that within a region, there really is kind of a cohesive strategy in terms of how the different um, local efforts fit within a broader regional uh, framework. Thanks. Yeah, I absolutely agree with everything you and Tara said. And I think that, um, Something that question brings up for me is having talked to folks in different areas of the state is really like taking time to assess where you're at in the process, what your needs are. If you're ready to launch into a planning process, you have all the necessary partners on board, or is there a need to take a step back and understand where capacity needs to get built in order to develop an effective plan. Um, and so speaking to that capacity building program that I touched on regional climate collaboratives. Um, just wanted to make a plug for that because of a comment I heard in the first panel around, um, you know, recognizing that some communities are able to have like a well resourced county can work with um, technical experts that are in the area developers, there are all these partners on board that have the knowledge, the resources, the expertise, um, they have connections to community groups and residents and they're able to roll out these beautiful comprehensive plans, other communities are not in that same spot. And so what that program would allow and what I think the other capacity building efforts the state is kind of moving towards is to concentrate on specific communities within a region that need additional capacity building support to be able to figure out who the partners are that need to start working together to get the resources in place to even do that partnership development and the initial like pre planning work. Um, the engagement and partnership development with community members. Um, I was really heartened and interested to hear a lot of what BCDC is doing. I actually think that many of those components are things that we could see being funded through the Regional Climate Collaboratives Program. Um, but maybe I'll stop going on about that one and just say that I think that we are um, encouraging folks to really take a look at where they're at in the process and what step in the funding they need capacity building planning or implementation for the different priorities they're trying to approach okay great yeah thank you i'll read out one of the questions and i guess this is directed to uh, to nointara you uh, what is the time frame so could you provide some specific information about the grant program uh, apparently uh, the website doesn't have a whole lot of detail when will you start accepting applications and who would the ideal applicants be yeah, so the link on the that I put forward or shared in the um, chat is where we're going to continue to update. As I mentioned um, in the presentation, we are still standing up these grant programs. And so the adaptation planning grant program is a little bit further along. We've been going through and ho um, hosting a series of listening sessions to inform the guidelines and we anticipate the guidelines for that funding program coming out in, in late summer. So um, more information will be available there. And then 
um, for the regional resilience grant program, you know, that really is a, a brand new program and we really want to be very thoughtful about how we're structuring that program. So we are going to be kicking off engagement, as I mentioned, and, and really um, kicking off a really robust stakeholder engagement to inform the guidelines. Because for that program, what we're thinking and what we've heard over the years in terms of the need is really falling across three broad categories of activities. The first is funding for regional scale coordination and collaboration and getting at that some of that capacity building that we've been talking about. We know in some regions there are well-resourced, well-structured regional entities that are already driving and guiding regional work. But in other parts of the state, that kind of social and um, institutional governance structure isn't there. So we want to be able to build capacity in regions where that isn't happening. But we also know that regional scale planning funding is also needed. And then third, regional scale implementation coordination and investment. So one of the things that we absolutely want to do over the course of this summer is make sure that we're really understanding kind of the landscape of needs across the state, across those three categories of activities, and then being very mindful to set up a grant program that's driving resources across all three, but isn't either holding communities back who are ready to go on implementation, have robust plans, have the right partners at the table, but also not leaving regions behind where they you know, are need to do some of that foundational capacity building. So long way of saying information on all of that will be coming soon on our website. And I also shared the link to the um, our newsletter, which is where we'll be making kind of more real time updates and directing people to the website as information comes online. But that one, we definitely want to be very mindful that we're building a really intentional program for our regional resilience fund. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can see us as a coalition, you know, interfacing with you quite a bit over the next few years, you know, we do get very frequently, you know, not just members, but others, you know, approach us, you know, um, what is, you know, how do I access this, you know, who do I speak to. Um, so I, I can see this happening in the future. Um, a couple of other questions, and you brought it up, it was about maintenance, you know, a lot of these programs, and, and again, this is, you know, Amy, for you also, a lot of the restoration grants and, and others, um, you know, there is design, there's construction, but in resilience in particular, this is so unique, as opposed to other projects, that adaptation requires a lot of monitoring and identifying when triggers have been reached and what to do at that time, right? So is there funding for monitoring and maintenance also included in some of these grant applications or will those be follow on grant applications? Yeah, that is an ongoing issue and a widespread issue um, with state funding. Um, I would say um, the governor's budget um, is um, general fund, uh, not, you know, in terms of, of the Coastal Conservancy funding and, and other um, climate uh, resilience funding. Uh, so there is a little more flexibility than say with bond funding. However, there are, you know, expiration dates uh, on the funding. I think many organizations would like it if we could you know, set up um, five or 10 year grant agreements to fund the implementation and then um, uh, fund ongoing monitoring and adaptive management. And typically the funds expire, <laughs> um, you know, be in a shorter time frame than that. Um, but given all that and the hurdles um, to funding monitoring and adaptive management, uh, we do see the value of, of doing that. And we have been able to uh, find ways to uh, support monitoring and adaptive management. Um, in San Francisco Bay, um, with the Restoration Authority, we're working towards a wetland regional monitoring program. So hopefully that will move us a bit away from very project specific um, monitoring that varies dramatically, you know, across 
different projects towards a more cohesive uh, monitoring program that um, could be funded um, at a more regional uh, level. And on given projects, like with Hamilton restoration, um, we did that with the Corps of Engineers. The Corps has a 13 year monitoring and adaptive management timeframe and we are cost sharing uh, that 13 years. And it's been um, very successful so far. So despite giving the Corps grief earlier, um, the, the Hamilton project, uh, I think was a, a great success and the core, I think we're at year six or seven of the monitoring. The site is uh, evolving really nicely and the monitoring data has given us information to go back in and correct issues like the berm for the seasonal wetlands being too low. So adaptive management actions. Um, and then in terms of our living shoreline work, sorry, I could just keep talking all day, but I am just going to mention I know there's the so much, I can see there is so much information. We're going to have a follow on yeah. mini summit. And I think John may talk a little bit about that. I know we are at time. So yeah, John, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no need for apologies. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dilip, Amy, uh, Coral, Noonan, and uh, Brad for this last panel. And I would like to thank all the panelists today, speakers and moderators who participated that made this program help happen. We just spent four hours with a lot of dialogue and a lot of information put forward. And I believe we had a great spring summit. And we also need to thank all the sponsors that helped put this summit on. And in addition to the, plan, be, the planning team for the spring summit and the staff at Big Planning Coalition, both Cameron Carr and Sophie Douglas for the great work they did. And more importantly, we need to thank all of you for joining us today. And we do hope that this will be our last virtual spring summit. Now it was talked about the mini summit and we're talking about holding this on September 30th. And so some of the questions that were not answered today, we will be addressing uh, at the summit. We want to make sure that we have to people to have adequate information in addition to the questions that were submitted we'll send to those people where the questions were raised and the bottom line is we have a lot of more dialogue but the fact is we need to really push for more action there's been a lot of talk over the years and the talk is getting us sometimes not far enough down the road um, we've had many thought-provoking ideas and comments today and we appreciate all that and we cannot, we can no longer in the Bay Area or the nation or the world for that matter, sugarcoat the impacts of climate uh, change and here in the Bay Area at sea level rise. As we heard today, doing nothing is not an option. The costs will continue to increase to fix or moderate what we need to do going forward. And the social, economic and uh, aspects of and fabric of our society are gonna be put at greater risk by doing nothing. We need to be creative. We need to uh, elevate based on economic, environmental, and social impacts, what we have to do. It will basically, as some people talk about, we need to break out of the silos that exist that we've all worked in because often too, too often the silos don't allow us to think creatively and do what needs to be done. Now, it was, during the program, it was announced the governor's uh, May revise, he's putting in $47.1 billion for climate uh, commitments. Hopefully more of that will be going towards what we talked about today. And I'd like you to consider becoming a member, get involved. You saw in the program, there's links, hyperlinks to allow you to get engaged on committees. We'd like to have you get involved with us. And again, we could not have done this without everybody who participated on the program today, as well as our sponsors and the BPC staff. I firmly believe that if we collectively work together the challenges that we are facing today are gonna to be our opportunities. And with that, I'd like to close the Spring Summit 2022 at 1 p.m. And thank you for all participating. Have a great day. Thank you all so much. Right at one.